Mic check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Mic check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Good.
The hearing will come to order. Welcome to the Committee on Ways and Means hearing on U.S. trade policy with our U.S. Trade Representative Michael Froman. Uh, the hearing will be conducted in accordance with the rules of the House and the appropriate decorum. <clears throat> I want to start by thanking Ambassador Froman. I believe this is your second tour uh, today of duty before our Congressional Committee. Uh, you and your team are doing very, very important work. Uh, we have a lot to discuss today, and this committee is going to do everything we can to try and make this work a success. Um, I want to just say a few things about trade. Expanding American trade is going to be one of our top priorities this year. And the reason, it's really simple. 95% of the world's customers live outside of the United States. I can think of few better ways to grow our economy than to grow our customer base. I believe Americans can compete with anybody if given a fair chance. That's why we have to break down barriers to our exports by completing trade agreements. Right now, there are several trade deals in the works, all of them showing promise. We're negotiating the Trans-Pacific Partnership with our friends in Asia, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership with our friends in Europe, the Trade and Services Agreement with countries around the world, and several agreements through the World Trade Organization. And if they're done well, all of them would help create jobs and expand opportunity. And all of them would help shape the kind of economy we leave to our kids. You know, the fact is, if we don't write the rules of the global economy, other countries will. Guess what? They already are. Other countries like China are putting in place new trade agreements among themselves. So it's as simple as this. If we're not moving forward, we are falling behind. Look at the record. If you add up all the countries that don't have trade agreements with us, we run a big manufacturing trade deficit. And if you add up all the countries that do have trade agreements with us, we run a surplus. So I think it's pretty clear. Trade and trade agreements, they're good for our country. We need more of both. And the first thing we need to do to get there is to pass trade promotion authority. Here's the issue. When the United States sits down at the negotiating table, everybody at that table has to trust us. They have to know the deal the administration wants is the deal Congress wants. Because if our trading partners don't trust the administration, if they don't think it will make commitments that Congress will undo later, then they won't make any concessions. Why run the risk for no reason? On the other hand, once our trading partners know that we are trustworthy, once they can see that we are negotiating in good faith, then they'll be more willing to make concessions. That's why we have to pass this bill before negotiations are complete. To get the best deal possible, we have to be in the best position possible. We can't be negotiating with ourselves. We have to maintain a united front. Now, I'm not saying to maximize our leverage, we have to maximize the administration's power. Actually, far from it. I'd no sooner trust this administration with more power than I'd trust the Patriots with the footballs at Lambeau Field. <laughs> okay, I... <laughs> what, 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 what I am saying... <laughs> at Lambeau Field. Not Massachusetts. Uh, but what I am saying is that this bill would maximize Congress's power. Let me explain. Nothing stops a president from negotiating a deal without instructions from Congress. Nothing. So if we just waited until after the negotiations are done to make our views known, if we simply reacted to what the administration put in front of us, well, we might just cut off the whole deal. That means we have to get involved before the deal is done, not after it's finished. We have to be proactive, not reactive. That's what TPA does. We call this process trade promotion authority. I think of it more as a contract. We say to the administration, if you want this up or down vote, you're going to have to meet three requirements. Number one, you have to listen to us, the co-equal legislative representative branch of government. Number two, you have to talk to us. And number three, you have to remember, Congress, we get the final say. First, TPA lays out our negotiating objectives for our trade deals. In short, we tell the administration what targets to hit. It's got to do things like eliminate barriers to our exports, protect our intellectual property, and eliminate unnecessary regulatory barriers in other countries. Second, T 
TPA requires the administration to consult with Congress. Any member can meet with our trade representative's office at any time. Any member can read the text. Any member can attend the negotiations. It's like a TPA hotline. And third, just to avoid any confusion, we put it right in the bill text. Congress gets the final say. If a trade deal requires any change in our laws, it is Congress that must approve them. And if the administration violates any of these requirements, we can say no deal. If it doesn't cooperate, it doesn't get the up or down vote that they want. We simply can't get the best deals without TPA, and that's why we've got to pass it as soon as we can. So TPA is front and center, but there are several other measures that we must take to help the economy. I think what I said may not be in agreement with what the gentleman to my left says. But there are a lot of things that the two of us do agree on. We need to reauthorize the generalized system of preferences, which expired last year. And I am committed to ensuring that a seamless and timely renewal of the African Growth and Opportunity Act is done as soon as possible. Both of these programs would let developing countries send their products to our shores duty free. Stronger trade ties among our countries would help lift up their economies and our own. The miscellaneous tariff bill, meanwhile, would eliminate duties on hundreds of products that we don't even make in our country and that our manufacturers need to build their own products. This is just common sense, and we need to find a way forward. And I do look forward to bipartisan agreements on many of these issues. Finally, Congressman Brady has done solid work on the Customs Trade Facilitation and Enforcement Act. The bill would help streamline our customs procedures and enforce our trade laws. And Congressman Bustani, he has tackled the problem of trade remedy evasion in a very creative and a very effective way. We need to get this legislation across the finish line. So we've got a pretty ambitious agenda in front of us. I look forward to learning more about the ambassador's testimony. And I look forward to this area because it has the promise of creating more jobs for Americans. And I look forward to working with my colleagues on these issues. And with that, I'd like to yield Mr. Levin for any time he might. Thank you very much and welcome, Ambassador. Welcome. The Trans-Pacific Partnership is potentially a trade package of historic significance. Economically, the 12 participants represent 40% of the world's GDP. New vital issues are being negotiated multilaterally for the first time. TPP has the potential to raise standards and open new markets for U.S. businesses, workers, and farmers. Or, on the other hand, to lock in weak standards, uncompetitive practices, and a system that does not spread the benefits of trade, affecting the U.S. economy, job prospects, and wages for decades to come. At this juncture, there are many major outstanding issues in key subject matters of TPP. The resolution of these issues will decide the merits of TPP and whether it's an agreement that builds on progress in recent FTAs. Last week, I put forward a description of what I believe to be most effective resolutions of the major outstanding issues. Achieving these outcomes could lead to a landmark TPP agreement worthy of major, of major bipartisan support and my own. The outcomes will affect the paychecks of American families now in the future. So we should focus on getting TPP done right. To achieve this, Congress at this point must not give up its leverage at this point by passing TPA where it can only say yes or no, until we here are fully confident that USTR is on a clear path toward effectively achieving these outcomes. Congress needs to assure itself of a fully active role in the effort to get TPP right. With the negotiations at a pivotal point, a pivotal point, within a few months it's set of final decisions being made on key specific issues and provisions, the congressional role must be instrumental. And we've played an active, important role in the past. Numerous trade agreements have been improved as a result. 
We put together provisions in the May 10th agreement on enforceable labor and environmental standards, as well as vital medicine provisions. We inserted into China PNTR provisions to strengthen enforcement of China's obligations, unfortunately not utilized, as well as trade enforcement and human rights provisions in Russia PNTR. And we insisted in the industrial provisions of the Korea F uh, FTA that it be renegotiated. And Dave Camp and I worked closely with the auto companies and auto workers. And the Obama administration went back and got a stronger agreement. This may not be the course suggested by those who believe that more trade is by itself so positive that any problem in TPP will work itself out over time. And for some others, there is no feasible way to do TPP right. So both, both now focus on process, on the Vehicle Trade Promotion Authority, and not on the vital contents of the TPP package that would be on that vehicle. Let me give a few examples why we need right now to focus on TPP. First, currency manipulation has cost the U.S. millions of jobs over the past decade. Bipartisan majorities of both the House and the Senate and staunchly conservative as well as liberal economists have urged the administration to include strong and enforceable currency disciplines in TPP. But the administration has not yet broached that subject in TPP. On agricultural market access, we continue to hear concerns from farm groups that TPP could lock in closed markets, particularly in Japan, but also in other countries. We must insist that tariffs be eliminated on virtually all agricultural products and that there be significant access for the few products where tariffs are, are not eliminated. On investment, The Economist magazine, the Cato Institute, foreign governments, and others from across the political spectrum have expressed growing concerns that the investment provisions of our tra trade agreements, particularly the investor state dispute settlement mechanism, could unjustifiably interfere with each nation's sovereign right to regulate. Recent examples are Australia's regulations of tobacco and Canada's handling of medicine patents. TPP needs to include new safeguards, as I proposed last week. Finally, TPP needs to preserve the provisions of the bipartisan May 10th Agreement of 2007. For example, this is the first time the U.S. has ever negotiated a comprehensive trade agreement with a communist trading partner. Vietnam must recognize that workers have the right to choose their own representatives, and we need to put in place an ongoing panel to ensure Vietnam's compliance. No less important are outstanding provisions on access to Japan's automotive markets, state-owned enterprises, rules of origin, environmental protections, and human rights. Giving Congress a fully effective role as well as for representatives of groups with a big stake in TPP negotiations, is an effective way, and I emphasize this, to assure other nations that the USTR is bargaining with strong bipartisan support. Finally, in order for all of this to happen, all members of Congress and cleared advisors must have full access to the negotiating documents including to the positions taken by other nations on a secured basis only where necessary. There's been some progress on transparency, but much more must happen. A full role for Congress at this important juncture in the TPP negotiations after five years with real transparency is absolutely essential. Nothing else will suffice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Froman, thank you for your time today. The committee has received your written statement, and it will be made part of the formal hearing record. Uh, if you wouldn't mind summarizing your remarks in five minutes so 
uh, members can get on with, with, uh, with, with the question and answer. I'd appreciate it, and you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman Ryan, Ranking Member Levin, members of uh, the House Ways and Means Committee. Thanks for the opportunity to testify. I will try and keep this short so to maximize the time for questions. As a central part of the President's overall economic strategy, our trade agenda is committed to supporting more good jobs, promoting growth, and strengthening the middle class in the United States. At USTR, we're advancing those goals by knocking down barriers to U.S. exports and leveling the playing field for American workers and businesses of all sizes. And as we work to open markets around the world, we're enforcing our trade rights so that American workers, farmers, ranchers, and businesses get the full benefit of the economic opportunities the U.S. has negotiated over the years. Taken together, these efforts have contributed greatly to America's economic comeback. Since 2009, America's total exports have grown by nearly 50% and contributed one-third to our economic recovery. During the most recent year on record, 2013, U.S. exports reached a record $2.3 trillion and supported a record-breaking 11.3 million jobs. And at a time when too many workers haven't seen their paychecks grow in much too long, these jobs typically pay up to 18% more on average than non-export related jobs. Over the past year, I've had the pleasure to travel around the country and heard many of the stories behind these statistics. I listened to small business owners in Colorado, Maryland, and Ohio, farmers and ranchers in Iowa and Wisconsin, manufacturers and service providers in Texas and the state of Washington, and many others. And across our country, what I heard was resoundingly similar. Confidence that as long as the playing field is level, our workers and businesses can win. Today, more small businesses are exporting than ever before. And by tapping into global markets, these companies are able to increase their sales and their payrolls. And that success is all the more impressive when you consider that the US is an open economy and other countries aren't necessarily playing by the same rules. That's why we're working harder than ever to bring home trade agreements that will unlock opportunities by eliminating barriers to U.S. exports, trade, and investment, while raising labor, environment, and other important standards across the board. If we sit on the sidelines, we'll be faced with a race to the bottom in global trade, not a race to the top. And as the President said last week, we should be the ones to engage and lead. That leadership is apparent in our work during the last year to advance the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP. The contours of a final agreement are coming into focus, and we've made important progress in the market access negotiations and in addressing a number of 21st century issues, such as intellectual property, digital trade, competition with state-owned enterprises, and labor and environmental protections. Another promising area is the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, or TTIP. And with a new European Commission in place, the U.S. and the European Union are moving forward with a fresh start in the TTIP negotiations, which will build upon the already $1 trillion in two-way annual trade. At the World Trade Organization, the U.S. is working to conclude an information technology agreement expansion deal, which would cover roughly $1 trillion in trade, while moving forward in negotiations on the Trade and Services Agreement and the Environmental Goods Agreement. This will be a critical year for trade, and we look forward to continuing our efforts to engage the public stakeholders and members of Congress in a robust discussion about how we're opening markets and creating opportunities for American exports, how we're raising labor and environmental standards to level the playing field for American workers, how we're promoting innovation and creativity as well as access to its products, and how we're ensuring that governments will be able to regulate in the public interest while giving Americans abroad the same kind of protections we guarantee domestic and foreign investors here at home. Mr. Chairman, as we move ahead, we're committed to providing maximum transparency, consistent with our ability to negotiate the best agreements possible. And we look forward to working with this committee and others in Congress to determine the best way to achieve that goal. There is no other area of policy that reflects closer coordination between the executive and Congress than trade policy. And to further strengthen that cooperation, as the President made clear last week, we look forward to working with Congress to pass bipartisan trade promotion authority. The previous TPA bill was passed over a decade ago, and an updated TPA bill is needed to address the rise of the digital economy and increasing role of SOEs, and to reflect the latest congressional views on labor, environment, innovation, and access to medicines. <clears throat> TPA also establishes the timeline and process for the trade agreements that we bring home to be reviewed, not only by Congress, but also by the American people. And again, the administration looks forward to working with this committee and the new Congress as a whole 
to secure a TPA that has bipartisan support. We also look forward to working with Congress to renew a number of other programs, including trade adjustment assistance, the generalized systems of preferences, which expired in 2013, and the AGOA program well before it expires in September this year. But we can only accomplish these goals and priorities through strong bipartisan cooperation between Congress and the administration. And together, we can ensure our trade policy continues unlocking opportunity for all Americans. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Uh, I've got a lot of questions, but I'll keep it to a couple in the interest of all the members' time. Um, last week, the President came, gave us the State of the Union, and called for uh, Congress to pass Trade Promotion Authority. And look, I don't agree with the President on a whole lot. Uh, but on this one, uh, I agree. And so we have here a bipartisan opportunity uh, to make a good difference for trade, for jobs, and to pass bipartisan legislation, to make divided government work, in other words. Um, we are going to have to update PPA. We're going to have to have a smart rewrite of the law that's appropriate. The question I have, because this has to be a bipartisan effort, is what is the administration doing to build support among Democrats for TPA? Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We've been engaged um, uh, for much of the last year and a half uh, with Democrats and Republicans on the Hill to brief them on TPP and to uh, engage them and make sure they're aware of what it is we're negotiating. And I want to thank uh, Mr. Levin in particular for the process that he's organized over the last year that allowed us to have some deep dive discussions on various issues on TPP. And we have a whole of government effort, including uh, the White House and the Cabinet, that are out there talking about TPP, the importance of it, and of course, also TPA. So we are fully mobilized and we are uh, consulting with members of Congress. Uh, we've got, as I said, the Cabinet and the White House, including the President, very much engaged on this issue and we'll look forward to working with you to secure progress there. Um, I'm from Wisconsin. Our license plate says America's dairy land. Uh, but we're quickly becoming the world's dairy land. So I want to go into dairy with you, if, if we will. In 2013, our dairy exports grew by 41%. Exports are becoming only more important um, than the entire U.S. dairy sector. They're becoming bigger than the beef sector, which is still pretty high. So it's pretty impressive. This is why we need to open up more markets for our dairy products in TPP countries. And this is my concern. I'm concerned that Japan is not doing nearly enough uh, and that Canada is not even negotiating to remove significant tariff and non-tariff barriers to U.S. dairy. I'm concerned that TPP countries might restrict the use of many common food names under the guise of geographical indication requirements. Um, the EU, for instance, insists that countries adopt this unjustified GI protections if they want to have trade with their members. We need to address these trade barriers. Look, this is my favorite cheese. It's, it's Wisconsin Gouda, smoked Gouda made in Monroe, Wisconsin, and smoked at Swiss Family Smokehouse in Evansville, Wisconsin. For generations, we've been making Gouda in Wisconsin. Yeah. And for generations to come, we're going to keep making Gouda in Wisconsin and cheddar and feta and everything else. So it is extremely important that we do not allow these countries we're entering into trade agreements to use these kinds of improper barriers to block U.S. dairy experts, exports. So give me a status report on where things stand on these non-tariff and also tariff barriers with TPP, EU, and Canada in particular. Well, uh, we couldn't agree with you more. And we're approaching, let's take dairy market access, really in three ways. One, as you said, is to uh, eliminate uh, tariffs or reduce tariffs wherever we possibly can. Secondly, to deal with SPS issues, sanitary and phytosanitary issues, to make sure that other countries apply sanitary and phytosanitary standards based on science and not on politics. And thirdly, on the geographical indications issue, and we think all three are important to having effective market access there. Uh, we are making uh, good progress in TPP on, on market access, including in dairy. We're not done yet, but we've been working with Japan over the better course of a year on the issues, going line by line through dairy, which is one of their sensitive products, and determining where there can be tariff elimination and where there can't be tariff elimination, and it's a priority for our producers, uh, working with the, the, uh, the government of Japan to find a way to create meaningful market access. As I said, those negotiations aren't finished yet, but we've made good progress. On the SPS standards, I think we're making progress on ensuring that they're based on science. And on geographical indications, 
I think you're, our system, in our view, works for Europe and the rest of the world. Uh, there are 18 trademarks registered in the United States to Parmesan Reggiano, and the European Union sells hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, of cheese in the United States. But we can't sell cheese in Europe. And so we believe our system of trademarks and common names is the appropriate way to go. We're working with our TPP partners to find a way for them to operate both with the United States and the European Union as partners that protects our ability to access those markets. Canada? And on Canada, uh, we have been engaged with them from before they came into TPP and made it clear that this was an issue that was of great interest to us. Uh, they also uh, underscored that it was sensitive to them. We are working with them, and we hope that we'll be able to achieve a successful outcome there. So we still have a ways to go to close these things out. That's, that's pretty clear, I think, on most people on this committee would agree with that. Um, I could go on, but I, I'll, in the interest in time, um, I'd like to yield to the ranking member, Mr. Levin, for any questions he might have. Thank you. I asked anybody if they had some car keys. I didn't bring mine. You uh, raised cheese, keys. I know. Um, these are the best keys we can find. Uh, um, but, I, thought, uh, I thought you'd have your universal with you, yeah, your universal But, but um, so, so it relates to, here we go. Just, no just so if the gentleman will yield, the reason Don't I have the cheese here time. is because it's a bet for Mr. McDermott. <laughs> I lost a bet with, do, with Dr. McDermott, so it's actually his cheese. Where, where's the cheese? <laughs> so, <laughs> so if you want to go ahead and pass it on down to him, you can have his cheese. All right. Jim, I won't take come up here. Time. So, I, I, I don't want to take your right. picture. Right. That's, yeah, that's, right. that's right. And some free range. Um, uh, but um, look, um, <laughs> I hope that doesn't come from my time. Thanks. Um, you know, I was tempted to raise car keys because one of the issues is uh, the domestic industry has been unable to get uh, cars into Japan. We've been trying for decades. And we need to have more than a negotiating objective. We need all of us to be involved in how an objective is being implemented specifically. We need to be involved in that process. Um, and I could ask you about that, and I know you'd say good progress has been made, but there are outstanding issues in terms of what will really happen. And the same is true, Mr. Chairman, in terms of dairy. Um, I think it's important, I'd like to see a TPP. Um, I think we need to be very actively involved as the, as the specifics are put together. And when, the, when Mr. Froman, the ambassador, says to you, it's good progress, I think he's saying that sincerely. But in terms of ag products, we need to know we need to, to know what the heck is going on and be able to lean in if it isn't going well or how it should go on a regular basis. That's, that's our challenge. It's not broad challenges, it's specific uh, provisions. Um, so um, I, I just want to emphasize that. Let me just turn now to another issue I want to ask you about, because I could ask you about currency, uh, but you're not the Secretary of the Treasury. On currency, which has so much to do with the livelihood of Americans, their paychecks, that issue hasn't yet been broached in TPP. There's been no discussion. And as you and I have talked, Mr. Chairman, we need to be very much involved in pushing that issue and getting it into the TPP negotiations because it impacts the paychecks of American workers and the, the, the prosperity of American businesses. And so we can talk as much as we want and we should about the importance of exports we also have to look at the path of imports. And currency has had a major impact on the imports that have come into this country and displacement. And we have to have that full rounded picture and our participation 
in how we address TPP so it comes out with a product that meets our needs and has a strong base of bipartisan support. So let me just say, ask you about uh, transparency. We discussed this last week, and I think I can't speak for you, but it was a subject of interest to both of us. So we haven't been able, we members of this committee, to look at all the documents to have staff write down what is in the text and also for us to know not only what other nations are proposing, but the specific proposals of other nations. And I think for us to be able to actively help frame a TPP that's worthy of support, we need to have that access. And so that isn't a matter of negotiating objectives. It's a matter of the specifics that we need to be part of. We need to find a way to do that. So there's just 41 seconds left if you would respond, please. Uh, well, <laughs> thank you, uh, Congressman. And clearly, consultation with Congress is a vital part of these negotiations. And it's not just the number of consultations. It should be also the quality of the consultations. And we look forward to to addressing any of those specific issues that you uh, want to address, to get into details and to dive deeply into chapter by chapter, uh, issue by issue. As you know, all members have access to the negotiated text. Um, uh, uh, several dozen have taken advantage um, of that. Um, and uh, we continue to look for ways that we can expand transparency and participation. And there are a wide range of views on that issue, including among members of of, of this committee and, and of the Senate Finance Committee. And we look forward to, to working with you and the chairman, uh, since it does uh, um, touch upon the jurisdiction of this committee, to determine the best way forward on that issue. Uh, we can always do better on transparency, and we're committed to working with you to, to find the best way forward. Okay, thank you. I think we're all in agreement we need to come to resolution on this. Um, Mr. Johnson's recognized. Uh, concern has been raised by some that Congress and the American people may not be adequately consulted during trade negotiations. Let me ask you, doesn't TPA actually strengthen congressional executive consultations, yes or no? Uh, well, yes, uh, Congressman. It is a mechanism by which Congress can update the procedures that they think are appropriate for consultations before uh, and during well, the are you listening to us? That's what the question is, I guess. Yeah, no, absolutely. And 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 part of our efforts to consult with this committee and and more broadly is to ensure that we have your input. I also just want to correct a, a misperception that's out there that somehow this is going to get voted on before there's adequate time for the public and Congress to review it in great detail. Of course, it will be public for months and months before there is any vote in Congress under traditional grants of, of trade promotion authority. And there'll be hearings, and there'll be questions, and there'll be scrutiny. And that is very much part of the process. At the end of the day, it is only Congress that can decide whether the trade agreement goes into effect or not. And it will make that judgment. Yeah, I hear you. Let me ask you, is the president, this administration, committed to following TPA requirements to the letter? Uh, uh, yes. I mean, we follow. Uh, we we've, we've, um, are very much committed to working with you on TPA and in TPA following the, the requirements with regard to the various provisions. Okay, and, and we're negotiating trade deals in the Asia Pacific and with Europe, and I, I wonder if you could tell us how TPA helps lead to better job creating trade agreements for America. Well, these trade agreements are gonna open up markets for our exports. They're gonna help level the playing field for our workers and our firms. They're gonna help protect American jobs and protect uh, American workers. They're going to create fairness in terms of a level playing field. And ultimately, they put us, not other countries who may not share our interests and our values, in the driving seat in terms of setting the rules of the road for the international trading system. So in all those regards, uh, this is an important step forward for defending American workers and American jobs. I agree with you. And what is the administration doing to help show Americans that 
job creating potential or trade agreements to build support for TPA? Well, we are we're uh, um, um, mobilizing our entire cabinet and our White House, whole government is out there talking about this. We've been out, uh, myself and uh, Secretary Pritzker, Secretary Liu, Secretary Kerry, Secretary Vilsack, Secretary Perez have all been out uh, talking with um, uh, around the country about the importance of moving ahead with this trade agenda. Uh, I will tell you that today we relaunched <coughs> our, uh, our website and on the website, it's got state-by-state -state material in terms of the benefits of trade on a state-by-state -state basis, and we continue to develop that material um, as we as the uh, agreements are coming, the final agreement is coming into focus, and we're going to continue to working with you to make sure we get that information out to the public. Good for you. Have you ever been to Texas? <laughs> I have been to Texas. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Dr. McDermott's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I didn't get my salmon over here to give you in exchange. Um, Mr. Froman, uh, global access to affordable biologics is a key component of this negotiation, and unlike traditional small molecule drugs, biologics are derived from organisms. <clears throat> They're used to treat cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, MS, and a variety of other things. In many ways, they represent the new frontier of medicine. For example, some of the drugs that are showed promise in Ebola our biologics. The prominence of these drugs in the lives of patients will grow in the coming years. In the next five years, the, for example, one quarter to one third of all new medicines approved by the FDA are expected to be biologics. Now, while these, job, these drugs represent the most, the next frontier, they are also very expensive. The annual cost of the biological drug Hepsin, Heparson to treat breast cancer is $48,000. In Peru, one of the 12 countries that is part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, breast cancer is the leading cause of death among women. But the cost of the drug like Heparson is out of reach for working class women in Peru. According to the World Bank figures, the gross domestic product in, per capita in Peru is $6,270. That's seven times, the, or takes seven years work to buy treatment for the drug. Of the, the illness. Before entering Congress, I worked in Africa and worked on the AIDS epidemic, and I, I saw what we were able to do by using generics in the treatment of that epidemic. We brought it under control. So <clears throat> my question really comes down to this. Why is the U.S. Trade Representative's Office putting forward provisions that would threaten access to affordable biological drugs in the TPP negotiation? Let me be specific about what I mean. A USTR provision setting data exclusivity for biologics, meaning that the patent holder has the data and they know what he can make a generic until that, that exclusivity runs out. Uh, you're tabling something at 12 years would meet a longer time for people to wait for lower cost drugs. The president is advocating a seven year period of data exclusivity in biologics. So a little bit more than half. I don't understand why you're going twice the length of what the president is talking about or is that, is there just um, no clarity or are you willing to tell us what, the, what you're really adopting because a 12-year standard, if we adopt it in TPP, would make it impossible for us to have it after seven years in the United States. That means people who could have access to the drugs because of the cost of generics being markedly reduced would be denied them for five more years because of a trade agreement we made with Trans-Pacific Partnership. And I, I, I don't understand how you think that works it seems to me there ought to be one standard for the world, and I don't think that it ought to be a long one. If the president says seven, let's, why aren't we talking seven? Why are you talking 12? So tell me about this data exclusivity, how long you think you're going to negotiate where it is today, because some countries don't have any data exclusivity. Some have a five-year standard. Some have a seven-year standard. And... We're talking 12. Where, where are we going? Well, thank you, Congressman. Thank you for all your leadership on that issue. Look, this, we have 40 million Americans whose jobs are related to IP-intensive industries. And our goal is, on one hand, to promote 
innovation and creativity in this country, and also to ensure access to affordable medicines, particularly in developing countries, consistent with the May 10th framework that Mr. Levin, Mr. Rangel, and the previous uh, administration uh, worked out. And that's the position, that's are, the- Are you saying that, that what you're putting forward on the table now is consistent with what we did in Peru so the, in the May the, 10th agreement? So the, the, that's the approach we've been taking to these negotiations where we look at where countries are in their stages of development and have a differentiated approach depending on where they are in their development. Now, you're absolutely right. Five countries have zero years of protection. Four have five years of protection. Two have eight years of protection. And we have 12 years of protection. And this is an area where right now there is no consensus among the countries about where to end up. But the, 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 the approach we've been taking is to ensure the, the, uh, both the promotion of innovation because without the innovation, you can't have generics and you can't have biosimilars down the road, but also ensuring the affordable access to medicines depending on a country's level of, of development. And that's the approach that we're taking in PPP. And you're saying the president has not said seven years. Uh, the, I think it's well known that in the president's budget, he has uh, uh, proposed seven years. Twelve years is currently the law of the land. And the practice that we use in our trade agreements, if Congress has spoken on a particular element like that, that is our initial position. Thank you. Mr. Thank Brady. You. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling this hearing. Ambassador, thanks for your good work on leveling the playing field for our American companies and workers around the world. You know, the world has changed. It's not enough to simply buy American. We have to sell American all throughout the world. <coughs> and the world's economy has changed since we last did trade promotion authority. It's been 13 years. Uh, the economy's, uh, the existing TPA is outdated. Uh, and doesn't reflect really the 21st <coughs> century economy our businesses and workers are competing in. Uh, I've noticed that the bipartisan draft from last year includes a balanced currency provision that uh, creates tools for the administration uh, to seek and address currency manipulation. I think that balanced approach is the right one, and going beyond that creates real risks and challenges, especially risks, to the United States. One risk is, challenge is that it will miss the mark. In true savings and investment in the country drives uh, much of uh, the value of their currency. Monetary policy and fiscal policy uh, does uh, is a huge part of it as well. Japan's a great example. The currency intervention didn't have an impact. Monetary policy has had a huge impact on depreciating the yen. There are challenges in getting this right both at the WTO and the IMF, uh, the currency rules are already fully enforceable. But as both the, the Bush and the Obama administration have noted, that often this is a challenge in, in uh, uh, setting the standard, defining uh, manipulation, and there's a concern that will distract from uh, more likely efforts to address currency manipulation around the world. And here's my point. <clears throat> Defining manipulation of currency really uh, is dependent upon def defining the intent of a country, and that creates risks for the United States, where uh, it could expose us to litigation um, in a trade agreement, uh, for example, particularly quantitative easing, which a country could, could uh, argue uh, that the Fed's QE reduced the value of the dollar by almost 8%, whether that was the intent or not. Not only would it be, be tied up in litigation, really would distract from real efforts, and I think that also helps shield real currency manipulators like China, who are outside of current trade agreement negotiations, wouldn't be subject uh, to these new obligations. And so not only does it create risk, you, you miss the real target on currency manipulation. So my, my question to you is, isn't the Obama administration committed to ending currency manipulation? And will you be using all your tools within TPA and across a broad spectrum of multinational organizations uh, to address currency issues? Oh, well, thanks, uh, Congressman. Yes, I mean, currency uh, misalignment is a top priority for the administration. And from this day one, we have worked to create a more level playing field by encouraging countries to move towards market-determined exchange rates and to deal with persistent misalignment. Uh, the Secretary of the Treasury obviously has the, the, the lead on this issue, and I, I know he'll be here uh, uh, next week and, and may speak on this uh, further, if you like. But, but we have been engaged, whether it's directly with countries like China, where from the president on down, we have pressed China to move towards more market-determined exchange rate. 
In June 2010, they began to let their currency appreciate. It's now appreciated about 15% in real terms. Not far enough, not fast enough. We're continuing to press them for market deterrent uh, exchange rates. Uh, we've been pushing in the, in the G7 where appropriate, the G20, the IMF. Uh, we're, using, we're, we're using every mechanism possible to try and achieve that objective. Are the tools within the TPA provision as drafted helpful to you uh, as you address this issue around the world? Well, I think as, as this committee and, and the Finance Committee proceed with a, a TPA bill, we'll want to have conversations uh, with, you, with you about that. Right. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Lewis. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, thank you for being with us today. And thank you for spending so much time meeting with members of this committee. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, I happen to believe that uh, trade policies should be a reflection or be a reflection of the values that we share as a nation and as a people. I would like for you to speak to the issue of human rights, labor rights, environmental issues, well, thank you, uh, Congressman, and, and I completely agree that this gives us, our trade agenda gives us an opportunity to promote our values as well as our interests in a critical part of the, of the, of the region and around, uh, and around the world. That's why it's so important what we're doing in TPP, for example, on labor and the environment. Uh, again, building off of the May 10th agreement, this agreement will have the strongest possible labor and environmental provisions, and they will be fully enforceable. They'll be in the core of the agreement, and they'll be fully enforceable, including with the availability of trade sanctions, just like any other provision of the trade agreement. That's what we are seeking uh, in this negotiation. And we'll take labor provisions as an example and be able to apply them now to half a billion people. And that's a huge transformation from where we were 22 years ago with NAFTA, where labor and environment were considered side issues. And over time, there's been a bipartisan consensus that's emerged that they should be treated like other issues in a trade agreement. So I think that's a very important uh, development there. We're also working specifically with countries where labor issues are uh, particularly acute, whether it's Vietnam uh, or other countries, to work with them to figure out how they can bring their labor regime into conformity with international labor standards. And again, this is only possible because we're engaged with them in TPP. If we didn't have TPP as our avenue for that engagement, there would be no possibility of improving the lives of workers in these countries and hence leveling the playing field for our workers. This is both important to do as a matter of values, creating dignity of work around the world, but it's also very important to leveling the playing field for, for our workers and our businesses who are competing right now against low wage workers around the world. Mr. Ambassador, you mentioned uh, Vietnam. Are you free to tell members of the committee where we stand with Vietnam? It's only one labor union by law. We are working with them and having a series of conversations about how to bring their system into conformity with international labor organization standards, including on rights of association, collective bargaining, forced labor, child labor, non-discrimination, acceptable conditions of work would include minimum wage, maximum hours, and safe workplace conditions, and what kind of capacity building they're going to need as part of that. I'm happy to, to arrange a time to sit down and, and, uh, and brief you in more detail about that. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield the balance of my time to Mr. Doggett. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Uh, I was recognized for one minute, 38 seconds. Uh, Ambassador, would you be willing to place several copies of the latest bracketed uh, draft uh, with the negotiating position of each of our trading partners here in a secure room in the Capitol so that members uh, and their staff with sec high security clearance would be able to go in, study it, take notes, and review it for as long as they feel is necessary in order to be good partners with you? Oh, this is one of the ideas that's been suggested, and we are open to having a conversation about that with the chairman, the ranking member, and also the finance committee to determine what the best procedures are for addressing My understanding addressing that. is that something similar was done back during NAFTA at different stages, uh, and uh, it seems to me that this negotiation over TPP has been going on for years, but there are strong restrictions 
on the ability of members of Congress to study it. Has any step been taken since I raised this concern in our meeting with you last Wednesday uh, to provide greater access to members of Congress and let us uh, have the opportunity to know if we're concerned about uh, cheese in Wisconsin, what position the Canadians are taking? Well, we're having conversations with, again, the chairman, the ranking member, and the same on the Senate side. Uh, precisely around those questions. Well, I have great confidence in both of them, but all of us have a vote on this that's the same as theirs. Uh, why shouldn't all members of Congress be able to get access with their secured staff and take such notes as they may feel necessary in order to record where various trading partners are, are what position they're taking? Well, as you know, every member of Congress can access the text. Several dozen have, including some members of this committee, and we're happy to arrange a time to come up and no, show you whatever text you like. There are limitations on it. I'll, I'll continue a little Thank later. You. Yeah, you'll have time when, when you have time. Uh, Mr. Nunes is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Froman, I want to thank you for uh, always making yourself available for uh, myself and I think the other members, uh, taking the time to go down to USTR, and you've been uh, willing to share uh, the information, and I would encourage all the members to uh, go down and do that. Uh, I'm going to be very brief. I'm going to submit uh, five questions for the record. Uh, I also uh, would like to reiterate the chairman's comments or concerns about Japan, Canada, as it relates to agriculture in general. Uh, Japan still has to go farther. Canada has got to put an offer on the table where they could blow this entire deal up. Uh, and then finally, just encourage you to pass TPA, help us pass TPA sooner rather than later. We're going to need the administration's help on that. And I'd like to yield uh, with the chairman's position, uh, uh, support, I mean, to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. T. Berry. Gentleman's recognized. Thank you. Ambassador Freeman, you've communicated the enormous benefits of trade uh, to the United States economy over and over again. And as you know, international trade supports nearly 40 million U.S. jobs, and the share of U.S. jobs tied to trade has actually doubled in the past 20 years. In addition, trade-related jobs pay an average of 18 percent more than non-trade-related jobs in the United States. And the President and you have both uh, said that U.S. economic growth depends on exports and, and doubling, tripling exports because 95 percent of the world's consumers live outside of the United States of America. As Chairman Ryan said, we have a number of major negotiations ongoing right now, and I, for one, want to make sure that you and your team have all the tools necessary to show that our trading partners that there is a strong partnership between this administration and this Congress, because our trading partners will then know that uh, we're serious, and they'll put their best offer on the table. In that vein, can you explain to, to us in simple terms what renewing TPA means for you and your negotiating team as you begin to finalize these negotiations in coming months? Well, Congressman, we have been working on one hand to proceed with TPP negotiations um, and to uh, complete elements of those negotiations consistent with the ambitious, comprehensive, high standard uh, um, benchmark that we've set for ourselves. And on the other hand, we've indicated that we want to work uh, in parallel uh, with uh, uh, Congress, bipartisan, Democrat, Republican, House and Senate to proceed with, with TPA. And um, I think that has allowed us to continue to proceed with the negotiations and continue to make progress. And we look forward to also making progress on the TPA bill. On another issue, China and several other countries have repeatedly targeted U.S. exports by biased remedy investigations, often in retaliation for legitimate trade actions taken by the, the U.S. And one specifically, the grain-oriented electrical steel, the GOES dispute, is one that hits close to, to home for me and, and my district. It's, um, it's a dispute in one of a string of WTO disputes, as you know, that demonstrates China's systematic abuse of its trade laws to support its own industrial policies. And through a severe lack of transparency and due process, you know, the WTA has ruled in our favor, in the U.S.'s favor. And I really appreciate the work that you and your team have done uh, thus far, specifically on the GOES issue. Uh, China has made some encouraging new commitments. However, many of us are concerned about the implementation of these commitments. As we go forward, what are you and the administration going to do? Uh, these are jobs in my district, for instance, uh, manufacturing jobs in Zanesville, Ohio. So we win, but yet 
we still don't win, if you know what I mean. How can we improve on this? What are the metrics? Well, look, I think we have to be uh, very aggressive in holding uh, China and our other trading partners' feet to the fire when it comes to applying their trade remedy laws in a WTO consistent way. We've brought 18 cases before the WTO, most ever, most ever above anybody, uh, nine of them against China, and a few of them in this particular area, which is the misapplication of their trade remedy laws. The steel case, the autos case, which affected, I think, over $5 billion of U.S. auto exports, uh, a poultry case where they were doing the same thing and applying their trade remedy laws. We've won each one of those, and we're going to continue to press them to bring their uh, application of their trade remedy laws into compliance with their WTO obligations. I look forward to working with you on that. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bracera. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ambassador, thank you for being here again and all the work that you're trying to do. I, I want to touch on the subject of currency because to me that's – if, if a country is going to cheat by devaluing its currency for the exclusive purpose of making its products look cheaper by keeping its currency value down, it obviously hurts American companies and American workers because it's tougher for us to sell our products to those uh, countries that are devaluing their currency. It makes it tougher for our companies to compete – uh, with those uh, uh, competitors that in that devalued country uh, when it comes to selling those products, our products against their, their products in other countries because they've got that advantage when it comes to currency. And I'm very concerned that we have yet to hear that this is an issue, currency manipulation, that will be included in any trade agreement. And I know that uh, often there's discussion about how you can do this through other fora, but uh, my sense is that we're not we're not taking this as seriously as we should. From left to right, economists tell us that we can, we're losing somewhere between a million to three or four million jobs by, have, by allowing countries to manipulate their currency and still bring products into the U.S., dump them in our country. So I'm wondering if you can go through with me the four factors that the IMF considers uh, relevant to determining whether a country is manipulating its currency. The first one is excessive foreign exchange reserves. If a country has really large surpluses and reserves of foreign currencies and it still has a really low value currency, something's up. Well, my understanding is that the United States has the 19th largest foreign exchange reserves, less than countries like Thailand and our Algeria. In fact, our reserves, foreign exchange reserves, are 20, 25 times smaller than China's. Uh, would that be a factor that we would concern ourselves with if we're trying to include currency manipulation in any agreement because we might be concerned that someone would accuse us of currency manipulation? Well, Congressman, let me answer the question this way. As you know, this is an issue of high priority, and you're right. We have been pursuing it through a number of means, whether it's bilaterally through the IMF, as you, as you note, as well as through the G7 and, and the G20. I think we share the same concern about the impact of this. But Ambassador, I'm going to run out of time, and I'm trying to figure out if which of these factors we're concerned will impact us and be, will be accused of foreign manipulation of our, our, our manipulation of our currency if we don't include, if we try to include a deal on currency manipulation in a trade deal. So, do you think that we, we could be accused of uh, holding excessive foreign exchange reserves? Again, I'm going to defer to the Treasury Secretary, who is in charge of this. Okay, so let me ask you, General, you'll just very briefly, we're going to have the Treasury Secretary here on Tuesday. I understand. But again, Mr. S Mr. Ambassador, you've been talking about intellectual property. That's usually handled by the World Intellectual Property Organization. Uh, you've talked about issues of labor. That's usually handled by the uh, International Labor Organization. So I'm hoping that you're willing to talk about currency manipulation, which is one of, the, I think, the, the severest forms of imbalanced and unfair trade that a country can get engaged in. Sometimes it's tough for some countries that don't have real strong institutions to enforce laws when a business is out there undercutting American industry. You know, you have to go after those businesses. But when a country itself is manipulating its currency to, to gain an advantage over Americans, American companies and American workers, that I think is despicable. And if we don't try to do something to avert that, we're essentially sending a very clear signal to those countries. We want to deal with you. We don't care if you enforce because we're going to let you yourself uh, violate the agreements so you can let your businesses do the same thing. Second factor that uh, the IMF typically considers in determining whether a country is trying to manipulate its currency to its advantage is that the country has a long and sustained surplus. 
I think we can move very quickly past that one because it's been quite some time since the United States has had a long and sustained surplus. Uh, the third factor would be protracted large-scale intervention in currency markets. We rarely, unless you can tell me otherwise, purchase foreign currencies, and certainly we haven't done it in some kind of protracted or large-scale manner. And the fourth factor that the IMF considers is fundamental misalignment of currency. Fundamental mis misalignment, meaning it's, it's valued in, in ways that it shouldn't be. If anything, our, our, our dollar right now is overvalued, not undervalued. And so I'm wondering where of those, which of those four factors we're concerned we would be found in violation of if, if someone were to attack us for trying to manipulate currency by doing the quantitative easing policies that the Fed Reserve has done, which has helped, helped keep interest rates low and allowed Americans to afford to buy a home and a car and so forth. I, I just am concerned that we see no action on the part of uh, the administration on something that bipartisanly an uh, overwhelming number of members agree on. Thank you. So Mr. I hope you'll get back to us on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You'll Ms. Mr. Ruggage recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, welcome, Mr. Ambassador. Good to see you again. Thank you for all your hard work and uh, uh, meeting with the, uh, the Friends of uh, TPP Caucus and uh, also your meeting with the uh, committee uh, last week. And I know we're working on some additional meetings and possibly even with uh, the President to help with uh, uh, your efforts on uh, TPA. Uh, NTPP, but uh, I wanted to just uh, initially raise an issue that you and I spoke about uh, um, last week, I think, and uh, it's really a critical issue, and I know I'm kind of outside your sphere of responsibility, but I'm, I'm hearing increasing concerns uh, from my constituents about the West Coast port contract negotiations. I understand there's been some minor progress made uh, in the last couple of days, but simply put, and I know you recognize this, the longer these negotiations continue, the, the greater the impact uh, on our economy and, and the American workers. Uh, for my district alone, I've heard from apple growers, growers and hay producers who have lost uh, half of their businesses and in turn have had to lay off employees uh, because they're unable to uh, export their products without delay. One grower in my district has laid off 200 employees out of 1,000, and if this goes on another couple of weeks, we'll lose another 40 jobs uh, waiting to see, you know, how these negotiations uh, turn out. And they're on track uh, to lose $1 million a week. Uh, so this is, it's critical. Uh, in the short term, Washington Apple and pear growers have lost an estimated $70 million in sales. In the long term, they are worried about the um, loss of, of business. Uh, they're reliable producers, and if they will uh, be able to recover uh, some of their losses uh, and recover some of their customers, because they're going to lose that, uh, that customer base. So this is a devastating way to realize how important trade is to communities in Washington State and across the country. And, and I just bring this to your attention, and, and, and hopefully you would encourage the administration, the president, and others to, to become engaged and uh, involved in, uh, in this process. Well, thank you, uh, Congressman, and thank you for your leadership on the TPP, Friends of TPP Caucus. Uh, my understanding is that the parties to the dispute have requested uh, federal mediation, and the Federal Mediation Service has, um, has agreed and is involved now in mediating that dispute, and we are hopeful that it gets resolved at the bargaining table. And I share that hope with you. Um, also, uh, just to dig a, a little deeper into a question that Mr. Tberry uh, posed, and, and that's the importance of, of TPA. I wonder if you could apply it to a specific uh, uh, topic that uh, uh, the chairman uh, uh, brought up, and that's dairy, uh, Canada and Japan. How, how important really, you know, you're, I want to maybe hear from you how you're going to sell TPA if I'm if I'm somebody opposed to TPA, how would you tell me, how would you sh sell that to me as, in, you know, as applies to Canada, Japan, and the, and the dairy um, producing uh, parts of our country, how important and how critical that is and how it might impact uh, your negoti negotiations there in a positive way? Well, look, historically, um, it, TPA has been an expression of the fact that the U.S. is negotiating with, with one voice and that there is support both in Congress and the executive for moving ahead. Our trading partners are following our, our political process and our policy process here uh, closely. Um, and as a result, we've been able to continue our work 
uh, in parallel on moving the TPP agenda forward, including on market access, um, as we move forward with Congress to make, uh, to make progress towards bipartisan trade promotion authority. Do you have a timeline on TPP? Well, we're, you know, we're, in, the, we're in the end game, and, there, and the number of outstanding issues uh, has been reduced greatly, but the ones that remain are, are, are still significant, and our negotiators, as we speak, uh, are meeting with the 11 other countries to try and resolve issues. So I hate to put a deadline on it because I think the timetable has <laughs> you know, to be I determined by the, by the substance, but I think all the leaders around the TPP countries have focused on trying to get this resolved in a, in a small number of months. Last issue, lo localization requirements. Any comments on that? It's been a key part of our, our TPP effort, as part of our digital economy um, uh, chapter. This is the first trade agreement that will bring into the digital economy fundamental principles from the real economy. And one of the key factors there has been to push against requirements that require companies to build redundant infrastructure in a country in order to serve that market. Making progress? We're making progress. We're not done yet, but we're making progress. Wonderful. All right. Keep up the good work. I yield back. Thank you, Congressman. Mr. Doggett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ambassador. Again, returning to this subject of secrecy, I think there's a big difference between quantity and quality on transparency. And as you know, and I've attempted to resolve this uh, in a private arena, uh, when a member of Congress goes in to take a look at this agreement, they can't take notes, they can't be sure what position is being taken by which of the various trading partners in TPP, and if they have a uh, chief of staff or a trade uh, rep who is, um, has a security clearance that would allow them to look at documents about ISIS, they cannot look at what the position of the Vietnamese is in this trade agreement. That is not uh, practicing transparency, it's practicing secrecy. And I can't find a legal basis uh, for that type of restrictive environment. And I would just urge you uh, to take immediate steps to change it uh, and to do something similar to the process that I outlined so that there's ready access for us to be partners with you on this. A second uh, issue that I think goes to the heart of this, uh, the chairman referred to it generally in his opening statement, uh, every trade agreement and, and every bit of trade legislation that's been considered over here in this committee that I participated in, I voted for more of them than I voted against them. But each time we hear uh, the promoters say uh, something about all the jobs that will be created and we hear the detractors uh, talk about all the jobs that will be eliminated, uh, practice may be that both uh, had some truth. Uh, but I'm interested in knowing more about uh, whether the administration has analyzed uh, whether Previous claims about our trade agreements uh, did produce net job growth agreement by agreement. Uh, for example, uh, in the most recent round, uh, we had the U.S.-Korea free trade agreement. Uh, isn't it accurate that while the administration claimed that there would be thousands of new jobs created uh, through that trade agreement, that to date we have actually experienced job losses, net job losses? Uh, well, thank you, uh, Congressman. Let me start with uh, Korea and, and work backwards. Um, first of all, let's take all of our FTAs together. As the chairman said, if you take FTAs as a group, we have a trade surplus. Yes, I heard in, that. In manufacturing. Just, just focus on Korea for a minute. In manufacturing services and agriculture, and that trade surplus has been growing. Our Korea agreement started going to an effect um, exactly when Korea started going into an economic downturn. And it underscores the fact that trade balances, bilateral trade balances, are much more a factor of macroeconomics than they are of trade agreements. Notwithstanding that, during a period of time when Korea imports from Japan declined by 12% and Korean imports from China declined by 3%, Korean imports from the United States climbed by 2%. And that was in part because we were able to reduce barriers on a relative basis to key markets. During this period of time, our auto exports have grown by 80% in value terms. Our big three have grown by over 20% a year from a low base, but they are growing. And when we disaggregate the numbers, because you and others have raised this question, so we spent some time looking at this, the decline of certain exports during that period were accounted for completely by corn, where we had a drought in this country and we stopped exporting corn, and by the decline of export of coal, which reflected the decline in the Korean economy. Now that the Korean economy is coming back... There may be many other 
uh, well justified reasons why this happened, but to date we have not experienced the job growth that the administration predicted. Isn't Last year problem? our goods exports to Korea were up 7%. I'm just asking you about the job growth well, it's data that Every billion dollars of ex increased at, exports at the beginning, seven support thousand jobs. We haven't had that, have we? Every billion dollars of exports. First of all, Korea is still being implemented. Not all of the tariff cuts have been put in place, but for every billion dollars of increased exports, it supports somewhere between 5,400 and 5,900 jobs in this country. Last year, our goods exports increased by seven percent. Our services exports increased by 25 percent. I'm glad to hear that, but we have not achieved what the administration said we would have. But if you feel that we need to take the long-term view rather than just a couple of years, would you react to the Department of Agriculture report in October? Uh, that we will not see, as I read it, any measurable effect on U.S. real GDP in 2025 relative to the baseline on agriculture exports from TPP. Well, I, we think everyone is expecting there to be significant agriculture export increases. We've reached a record level already last year in $150 billion, and this agreement will bring down tariffs and you disagree the number with of areas. The, re the report that bringing down those tariffs won't increase uh, GDP? I think there are a number of reports out there, including the Peterson report, the, a number of others. I'm referring think, to USDA October 2014. <clears throat> well, I'm happy to take a look at that and come back to you on it. Time for the gentleman has expired. Uh, Dr. Bustani is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ambassador Froman, I want to thank you for uh, your fine work and your team, and also want to thank your team for bringing negotiating text over to my office for review and answering a lot of questions about our negotiating position and our interlocutors as well. So it, it was very helpful, and I hope you continue to do so. I, um, I want to talk about China for a moment. Since the third plenum, the Chinese leadership have consistently talked about how the market will play a greater role, and yet... Uh, their government actions seem to belie this statement, uh, particularly with anti-monopoly law and other elements uh, that they're using to, to create discriminatory practice. So what is the administration's uh, strategy for 2015 to deal with this? Can you give us some insights? Uh, I know we have JCCT, SNED, and so forth, high-level negotiations, but what are we really doing to try to get to the bottom of all this? Well, we have all those issues very much on the table, as you said, and you're absolutely right that if you read the, tw the third plenum statements, there are a number of positive comments out there about letting the market play a greater role. And part of what we're doing, whether it's in there um, pushing on uh, their, the way they look at technology, intellectual property rights enforcement, uh, forced localization, uh, the application of their anti-monopoly law, uh, or the liberalization of various sectors, uh, we are pressing them to take actions that are consistent with their own words in the third plenum. Uh, one of the areas we're doing that through is the, uh, the bilateral investment treaty negotiations, where we expect that this year they will give us a so-called negative list. And when the importance of the negative list is that it means that China will open up its economy for various activities, except for things that are specifically regulated on that negative list. So if the negative list is very long, then and they're not terribly serious about opening their economy. If it's short, uh, and targeted, uh, then uh, it will help reinforce reform within China, and that's certainly something that we want to and encourage. Do you feel like we're making progress in narrowing down on that list? We have not yet seen the list. They're, they're planning, uh, they've told us they will be giving us the first version of that list, uh, or uh, the first part of this year. First part of this year, okay. Uh, congratulations on getting a little bit of a breakthrough at APEC on ITA. Uh, can you give us a little indication of the status in Geneva now on the actual tariff reductions? Well, that breakthrough with China allowed us to restart the negotiations in Geneva. This is an agreement that will cover a trillion dollars of trade. It's estimated to add $190 billion to the global economy and support 60,000 additional jobs in the U.S. Uh, we, we are now pressing the parties to try and reach closure on it. I think there's a fundamental dispute between Korea and China uh, over various products, and we're encouraging China to show some flexibility and to try and bring closure to this. Last year, I asked you about the Jones Act and the administration's position on uh, maintaining our, our, our policy with regard to the Jones Act. Is that still the administration's position? Uh, it is. Uh, there are a number of parties who are interested in expanding access to our maritime services. Uh, uh, this has always been a sensitive issue for us, and we've made that clear. I appreciate that. Uh, with regard to shrimp imports into the United States, Malaysia and Vietnam have been problematic uh, in regard, uh, with regard to subsidies that they use. And uh, we feel down in, on the Gulf Coast that this creates unfair competition. So 
in the context of our negotiations in TPP, uh, I hope we will be addressing these issues as well. I know we have a lot of work to do with Malaysia and Vietnam. And um, finally, as my time's running down, uh, the uh, investor state dispute settlement mechanism, this is very important for a number of our industries, uh, the energy sector in particular. Uh, could you give me a little indication of where we are with, uh, with that in negotiations? Sure. The purpose of investor state is to give Americans abroad the same kind of protections that we provide under U.S. law, under our Constitution, to domestic and foreign investors uh, in the U.S. And the U.S. has been at the leading edge of reforming ISDS, updating it, upgrading it, to make sure it's absolutely clear that governments can regulate in the public interest. Uh, we've closed various loopholes uh, that we believe uh, have been subject to abuse. We've raised certain safeguards, added additional safeguards about dismissing frivolous claims, uh, being able to award attorneys fees, opening it up and making it more transparent so that civil society organizations and others can file briefs and see what the result is. Uh, but we think that fundamentally it is important that the, the 23 million Americans who work for firms that have investment abroad have the same kind of protections that we provide here in the United States. I thank you. And, and with the final seconds, just give assurances that the trade and services agreement is still the top priority as well. It is a top priority. We're making good progress, and we hope this will be a very productive year in that regard. Thank, thank you. you. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Thompson is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ambassador, thank you for being here. Uh, I, I agree that trade is a very critical part of our job creation in, in this country, uh, but I also uh, agree with my friend from Washington State. It's hard to make it work when you can't get your product to market. And uh, Washington's not the only state with port problems on, on the West Coast. As you know, the uh, Port of Oakland is experiencing some real problems. And I've had a couple of businesses in my district, uh, one who couldn't get product to the UK uh, during the holiday season, and that was a big hit for them. Uh, and an, another one that's uh, just about had to suspend uh, all their business activities because they, can't, they couldn't get the stuff in that they need to, uh, uh, to produce their, their product that they sell. So uh, anything and everything you can do to uh, nudge the administration into speeding up this settlement is critically important because we can do all the trade in the world if, if we can't get what we make uh, on the boats and get it overseas. Uh, it's not going to help us, uh, help us much. Uh, on the issue, uh, on one issue that we've talked about in, in the past, and that's the uh, issue of uh, rice. Um, What's the status of the expanded market access for U.S. rice with Japan in both terms of the quality uh, and uh, quality of the access and the quantity of additional U.S. rice allowed into, Jap into Japan? And do you think that they've put their uh, best deal forward? I'd say this is one of the, uh, the outstanding issues on market access uh, with Japan. And we are, as you suggest, pressing for both the quality and the quantity of the access to be increased. It's extremely important for not only California, but a number of the uh, rice states, and it's, this is a, uh, an important issue for, uh, for me. Uh, you visited my district back in 2013, and thank you very much for doing that. And You met with a range of folks who were involved in the uh, wine business in my home county. Uh, and uh, of those home county folks, uh, they talked to you about uh, the issue of a, uh, to develop a, a multilateral system to protect regional uh, wine names and appellations, uh, such as Napa Valley. And uh, in many different uh, countries, uh, there's a huge problem with this. A as you know, we, we constantly fight this battle uh, with China. But can you expand on how our trade agreements will help protect the names of appellations of uh, origin, such as the United States, U.S. government recognized delineated grape growing areas or viticulture areas? Well, we're working with stakeholders uh, on that issue um, and distinguishing uh, what we can do there from, from the, uh, the broader approach on uh, uh, geographical uh, indications. Uh, but it is something that is important, and we have, a, as you know, a global world wine group that works on common practices in this regard, both labeling uh, and other issues related to, to, uh, to the wine trade, and we're active in that group to try and promote those interests. I just can't emphasize enough uh, how this is something that we just can't acquiesce on. Uh, this is uh, a huge problem for 
uh, for, the, for that community, uh, not just in my district, but throughout the country. Uh, and if, if we're not able to uh, solidify uh, good protections, uh, this is a, it's a huge, huge uh, problem. And the enforcement uh, is also in, important, so I'd hope that you take a, a real good look at that. And can you give us an update on the short supply list uh, and, uh, and how many products are on the list, what percentage of the current trade is covered by the list, how will any future changes be accommodated? Um, I'll, I'll get back to you on some of those specifics in terms of numbers. I will say that our approach to the, the textile and apparel um, parts of this negotiation is to combine our yarn forward rule with a short supply list, strong rules of origin, and customs cooperation and enforcement. Uh, to ensure that that uh, all those rules work well together, um, uh, we are uh, not quite done yet in that negotiation, but we're uh, but we're close, and we're working to to try and resolve the outstanding issues. And I can get back to you on the specific numbers of how many products are on the list. And how about the immediate elimination of duties on performance apparel that utilize the short supply list? Um, I believe we've been working very closely with uh, the outdoor industry, um, the outdoor apparel industry. And uh, I believe we're coming up with a solution that they find to be uh, quite constructive on that. And that includes the outdoor footwear folks as well? I believe so, yes. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Roscom is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ambassador, thanks for what you're doing for our country. I appreciate it very much, and I know my constituents do as well. Um, two questions. One's kind of a blue sky question, and then one is more, more technical. The blue, sky, the blue sky question is this, you know, you think about all the things that we're talking about here, but if you step back, this could be great. I mean, this could be really great if TPA happened and TTIP and so forth. Um, in your opinion, how great could it be? So what's the growth that we're talking about in terms of potential? You know, there's all sorts of estimates, but can you give a range or, you know, what, what you think is realistic based on your experience, the growth that we could expect from TTIP, for example, the growth that we could expect from TPP if you've put pen to paper? Well, let me, let me take a step back and try to answer that. Um, uh, I do think we are on the verge of uh, something very important here uh, because through TPP uh, and through TTIP and through the rest of our trade agenda, by fo focusing on protecting workers and protecting jobs here, by creating a fair and level playing field, by raising standards abroad, uh, and by making sure that we're the ones who are defining the rules of the road, consistent with our interests and our values, not ceding that to other countries, we're creating a network of high standard agreements that puts us at the center of a free trade arrangement that ultimately will encapsulate two thirds to three quarters of the global economy. And what that means is, and, and, and I see this uh, virtually every uh, couple weeks, I'm visited by some company who comes and says that because of the strengths of the American economy, the attractiveness of the market, the fact that we've got strong rule of law, an entrepreneurial culture, a skilled workforce, and now we have affordable, abundant sources of affordable energy, when you layer on top of that these trade agreements, it makes the U.S. the production platform of choice. It makes the U.S. the place that companies want to put their next factory, their next production facility, both to serve the U.S. market, but also as an export platform for Asia, Latin America and Europe. So I, I, without getting into the numbers per se, because there are a wide range of numbers, I think we are really on the verge of something quite significant in terms of positioning the US going forward in a very positive way. I mean, is this like 1% growth GDP? Is this a half a percent? Is it two, the, is it three? Can you even as an example, As an example, the Peterson Institute, who has done one of the studies of this, has suggested a 0.4% growth per year just because of TPP based on the 12 countries. I believe. On TTIP, there's a wide range of estimates depending on uh, what ultimately uh, we're able to accomplish in terms of trying to bridge our regulatory and standards uh, differences. And so it's hard to estimate until that comes into greater focus. Um, next question, far more pedestrian, catfish. So we've got these catfish rules that I don't think the administration likes particularly well. There's a lot of people in Chicago that don't like them particularly well. They're duplicative and so forth. Is, is number one, is this on your radar screen? Number two, um, are you able to sort of navigate through um, so that we don't get into a, uh, a trade war hassle um, with Asia over catfish rules? Well, it, it's very much on, uh, on our radar screen. I know Secretary Vilsack, um, it's very much on his 
uh, radar screen, and uh, we hope to be able to proceed uh, in a way that's consistent with our obligations. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ambassador. I appreciate people dealing down with the details. Details matter greatly. I want to identify myself with the comments you've heard about uh, the goal here of, for example, as we are studying these, being able to have a staff member in the room with us. I think that ought to be a no-brainer. I think it would be helpful. It would help every single member here, and I think we ought to just clear that away. I also strongly identify with what you have heard about the concerns for engaging currency manipulation uh, with Secretary Liu, with you at every juncture. This is a huge reason why we've lost manufacturing jobs in this country, and I hope going forward we have currency st uh, provisions strengthened so that we don't fall victim to that in the future. Uh, I appreciate my colleague, Mr. Thompson, mentioning apparel and footwear. Uh, the, the responses I'm getting are very encouraging, and I appreciate your hard work and putting up with some of us uh, talking about it. I think it's going to make a big difference. It makes a big difference in my community. Apparel and footwear is one of the reasons why uh, we're, uh, I think, the fourth largest metropolitan area in the country in terms of value exports. It, we, we have a surplus both in terms of goods and services. Uh, our state has a surplus with China, but being able to deal directly with these items uh, in the way that it's spirit that's been offered, I think, makes a huge, huge difference. Uh, I would, uh, there are two items that are of concern to me. Uh, I will briefly outline them in your response now or being able to follow up after, after the hearing. Uh, first deals with environmental provisions, and I appreciate that not all the 14 or the other the 12 countries are on the same page environmentally, and I appreciate the United States has been pushing because many of our trading partners aren't there at all. The area of illegal fishing drives me crazy. Uh, we're in a situation now uh, where uh, we have uh, a third of the world's fisheries involved with these dozen countries. Uh, they are engaged in a, in a practice absolutely not sustainable uh, and uh, pretty reckless practices. Um, and I've originally, uh, our conversations have been positive. I picked up some things from the uh, advocacy groups, but I'd appreciate elaboration on that. The second deals uh, also in the environmental sector. I have been deeply concerned about illegal logging, spent a lot of time on it. I've raised concerns with you about how aggressive we are in enforcing the provisions that we've, in, that we've negotiated with Peru. Uh, illegal logging uh, puts uh, American companies at more than a billion, put aside the havoc that it, wreck, that it wreaks environmentally, the corruption, uh, the harm to indigenous people, uh, it puts American uh, forest products and manufacturers in the whole about a billion dollars. Um, let me just use, for example, the, the example of uh, Japan. Uh, Japan uh, is, uh, we're in, in the final stages here, you're doing, you've got lots of uh, provisions you're dealing with. They're the fourth largest consumer of wood-based products, and they import a disturbingly high percentage of high-risk timber products. Uh, their legality verification system is entirely voluntary, as near as I can tell, and has serious design weaknesses that limits its ability to, elimin uh, to eliminate illegal products from the Japanese market. Can you talk about the work that you're doing and how this might make a difference with illegal logging specifically as it relates to Japan? Uh, well, thank you, Congressman, and thank you for taking the time to, to read the text and give us some input on it throughout the negotiations. Uh, yes, I mean, these areas, like illegal fishing and illegal logging, are one of the innovations of TPP. They're part of this conservation chapter, which goes beyond what we've done before in terms of addressing environmental issues that are central to this region. Wildlife trafficking, illegal logging, illegal fishing, the subsidization of overfishing, uh, issues around shark finning and protection of the marine environment. Uh, all of this will make this a very strong agreement. And the TPP countries, we're pressing them to take on obligations uh, to deal with exactly what you're saying, which is to take action to address 
their illegal, illegal logging practices that are affecting trade with their markets. Uh, we're doing this country- Comment by, about Japan. Well, all the countries will be taking on obligations to deal, to strengthen their capacity to combat the trade of illegal logging, the, produ the products of illegal logging, uh, as well as in these other areas. And we're working with each country to determine whether they have the procedures in place and what kind of procedures they'll need to, to pursue in order to address them. Thank you, Ambassador, for being here today and sharing uh, your insights. I think this, uh, this hearing is particularly productive in proof that uh, we can uh, tackle issues uh, of common interests and, and, and address uh, the, the challenges that we, that we see uh, within a particular issue, especially as it relates to trade. And I know that uh, these in initiatives are very important, and, and you see that, and I appreciate uh, the priorities uh, that, uh, that you see uh, behind uh, trade. We know it's an, an important to our economy uh, as an entire country. I know that uh, the United States is the largest exporter of food and agriculture commodities. And uh, to brag a little bit, uh, Nebraska's third district is uh, the largest agriculture district in the country. So uh, there's a lot of cheese that, that wouldn't exist without corn. Uh, we may not produce a lot of cheese, although we have a little bit in, in Nebraska. Uh, we're happy to uh, ship some to Wisconsin and, and point, points beyond. Um, <laughs> but with ag interests in mind, um, I know that other, other members here on the dais have, have uh, referenced the, the dispute uh, taking place at our ports, and I, I do want to add emphasis. Uh, the, the concerns that are out there, especially with products such as pork and beef, uh, that are allowed to, to spoil, and not just uh, uh, reducing the value a little bit, but uh, eliminating the value altogether in many cases. And so I would, I would hope that we can get these issues resolved. I know it's not an issue of your particular jurisdiction, but I, I hope that, uh, that you can address that uh, with, uh, with the rest of the cabinet and other interested parties in the administration. Now switching gears just a little bit, uh, certainly I want to thank you for your efforts to engage the Chinese. It's been in, discussed a little bit uh, as it relates to the S and ED and JCCT. Uh, but in engaging uh, the Chinese as it relates to bio, biotechnology uh, and innovation, uh, certainly in the, in the agriculture sector. And can you tell me how the administration will keep this issue elevated throughout the course of the year uh, and as it relates to the new strategic ag innovation dialogue? Uh, well, thank you, Congressman, for, for mentioning that dialogue. This was one of the outcomes of the JCCT in, in December. Uh, we were able to secure the approval of three specific biotech event applications, but uh, even more importantly, perhaps, the commitment to engage in a dialogue about their biotech approval process more generally and how to bring it into line with international practice and international standards. So this is a dialogue that uh, USDA and USTR will co-chair and will co-chair with a number of Chinese uh, ministries on, on their side, and we're hopeful that this will help bring their system into conformity so as to open further trade between ourselves in China. And thank you. Uh, in a related vein, uh, the European Union has not approved a single biotechnology product for import since the fall of 2013. Can you discuss how the U.S. plans to address uh, ag biotech issues in TTIP? Well, we have uh, raised this issue uh, directly. I've had my third meeting with my counterpart, uh, the new trade commissioner there, and at each one of these meetings, this issue has been raised. We share the concern that they did not approve any biotech events over the course of 2014, there are, I think now, as you say, 12 in the pipeline. And these are applications that have been approved by the European Food Safety Administration as being safe. And our position overall on these issues and more generally in TTIP is that we're not trying to force anybody to eat anything in Europe, but we do think that decisions about what's safe should be made by science, not by politics. And we're encouraging them to move ahead consistent with their WTO obligations, consistent with the European Court of Justice case, uh, that ruled against them for not approving such events in the past, and we're trying to encourage them and the new commission to take these up. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Kind. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ambassador Froman, I want to thank you for your testimony today, but also I want to just 
quickly commend you and your USTR team for the level of engagement that you've had with this Congress thus far, this committee. Obviously, some of the uh, breakout sessions we've had with Mr. Levin, with other members who are not on the committee, the numerous meetings and walkthroughs you've had with members of my own coalition that I'm leading, the New Democratic Coalition. And uh, we do appreciate the access to text and being able to walk through with your team specific questions or concerns that we have. And it's that level of engagement and partnership and transparency that's going to be crucial as we move forward in, in the coming days. You indicated that you're in towards the final round of negotiation with TPP. Uh, one word of caution. Obviously, these trade debates and votes are always difficult on the Hill, especially with the ec economic anxiety that still exists throughout the country. Having the best possible agreement that you can get is going to be crucial to finding the support that we need to get it across the finish line. But a week and a half ago, my Green Bay Packers thought they were in a game that was 56 minutes long, not 60 minutes long, and literally fumbled the ball and lost the game. I, I encourage you not to do the same thing in the course of these negotiations. We are right now the strongest locomotive engine when it comes to global economic growth, and I can imagine that your uh, negotiators across the table will be asking for us to make the biggest and last minute concessions in order to get to yes in this agreement. But we need market access. We need May 10th. We need SOEs. Uh, we need all that as part of this agreement so it's as strong as possible so we can begin leveling the playing field for our businesses and our workers. And I also appreciate the fact you took time last year to come into Wisconsin. My district met with a lot of our businesses, large and small, but also did a visit to a family dairy farm and met with many of the family farmers uh, there too, uh, expressing what TPP is all about and uh, the potential for trade uh, in our region. Uh, Oftentimes, there's a lot of focus or a lot of discussion or rhetoric that these trade agreements are nothing but sops to big businesses done behind closed doors you know, with a lack of transparency. But there is an important aspect of this when it comes to small business economic growth and sales. And I want you to just take a moment to explain what the benefits are to small businesses throughout Wisconsin and the rest of the country with TPP, for instance. Because today, if you're a small business, with a good product or service and you're on the net, there are no boundaries anymore. So these agreements could have a tremendously important role for small business growth in our communities as well. If you want to take a moment to address that aspect of these negotiations. Well, absolutely, Congressman, and thank you for your leadership on uh, with the new Dems and, and more broadly on, on these issues. Uh, you're absolutely right. 90, we have 300,000 firms in the U.S. that export. 98% of them are small and medium-sized businesses, businesses with fewer than 500 employees. And yet only about 10% of small businesses export, and most of those export to only one country. And so the opportunity is immense, including, as you say, through uh, the internet and through the digital economy. Uh, I've met uh, with a number of different uh, people who participate in something called Etsy. Etsy is an online platform, about 88% women, who sell baby clothes and toys, sometimes part-time out of their homes, and they're selling them all over the world. And when they engage through Etsy with their, the 95% of the customers are, uh, of the world who live outside our country, they're using telecommunication services, software services, electronic payment services, express delivery services. Those are all issues that we're addressing in TPP, making sure that those services stay open that our providers can continue to provide them and, and expand their access in these markets to make it possible for small and medium-sized businesses all over the country to engage in, in global commerce. Uh, and that's just one of the many ways. This is the first trade agreement that's gonna have a specific chapter on small and medium-sized businesses, making sure that from soup to nuts, this agreement works for them, that they become part of global supply chains or able to take advantage of the growth of global markets. And finally, it seems as if battle lines are being drawn pretty quickly around here in regards to TPA or TPP, and it's a little perplexing to me because we don't have an agreement yet. And how can you come out in favor or, or in opposition to something that doesn't exist yet? And the same is true for TPA. We don't even have language yet, and yet somehow members are starting to take positions already on things that are still in the works and still being negotiated. And I keep coming back to this one issue, and that is, if we do turn our back on TPA or these negotiations in TPP or TTIP, what are the consequences to the U.S., not only economically but as far as global leadership? Well, I think the consequences are, are, are serious. I think the president referred to them the other night. You know, we really face three alternatives. There's the status quo, which a lot of people feel aren't working for middle-class Americans, for working Americans. 
There's the, the trading system where the rules of the road are defined by others who don't necessarily share our values or our interests, where they carve up markets at our expense, where they don't protect intellectual property, they don't take on SOEs, they don't preserve a free and open internet, they don't respect labor and environment. That has got to be worse for our workers and our firms than the status quo. And then there's TPP, which gives us an opportunity to set the rules of the road for the most important, fastest growing region of the world, and potentially even more broadly, based on our values and our interests. So there is a tremendous amount at stake here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that, those bells are votes. We will do one more Republican, one more Democrat. Uh, it's 10 minutes of questions. That gives everybody time to get to votes. There are three votes. We look, looks like the walk-off time is 4.15. Uh, we will recess subject to the call of the chair for the second questioner and then resume immediately after the, the, the third and final vote. So for members, please come back immediately after. We will resume. Uh, this time it is Miss, Mrs. Jenkins' turn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for being here. I wanted to talk a little bit about trade and services agreement negotiations. Uh, they've grown to include over 50 countries so far. Uh, the service sectors, as you well know, in these countries account for half of the world's economy and over 70 percent of global services trade. As such, the trade in services agreement has massive commercial potential and must, along with our TPP and EU negotiations, be a top priority for Congress, the administration, and U.S. industry. Services represent roughly 80% of the U.S. GDP and 75% of U.S. private sector employment, so increasing our service firms' export opportunities promises to be a major source of well-paying American jobs. Existing trade rules on services trade over are over 20 years old, and I'm enthusiastic about TISA's potential to update these rules among its members and the incorporations protected for U.S. services suppliers that we've developed in our trade agreements and recent bilateral investment treaties. But I hope our negotiating partners share our level of ambition. Could you just share with us what USTR will be giving a high uh, standard TISA the priority that it deserves, pressing to incorporate our best trade agreement protections for U.S. service suppliers. Well, thank you, Congresswoman. And that's very much uh, high on our agenda. You've described it well, both in terms of the implications for the U.S. economy, for the 75% of American workers who work in the, in the services sector, and where we see some of the fastest potential growth uh, in exports we expect to come out of services, both directly and because services and manufacturing are so much more intertwined than they used to be. So we are very much pursuing a high standard agreement uh, in Geneva with our, those uh, 49 other countries, uh, representing 70% of the global uh, services market. Uh, we've had a pretty good year last year in terms of making progress in the negotiations. We've got a, a good beginnings of a, of, a, of, a, of a set of rules, and I think 21 out of the 23 uh, negotiating entities have tabled offers, and we expect that this year will be an important year for making progress in those negotiations. Thank you. Glad to hear it. I yield back. Mr. Pascrell. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ambassador, thank you. Uh, I think that you've been more forthright than the last five reps, trade reps put together. That doesn't mean I agree with you, but I think you've been more <laughs> forthright. <laughs> You know what, what's fascinating about the Peruvian trade deal, one of the very few I've ever voted for, was that there was movement before the agreement on the part, and I don't want to only talk about one country as compared to the TPP, but there was movement on the part of Peru before the final agreement. There was effort made to have the other party show good faith, and I think that's critical. I think it's critical. I mean, we've got some major hurdles we have to cross over here before we get to a final agreement. In testimony uh, before our committee earlier this month, Professor Simon uh, Johnson of MIT and the uh, MAF noted that from 1986 to 2006, there was little change in average income for the bottom 90 percent of wage earners, while the top 1 percent experienced a gain of around 50 percent, the gains for the top one-tenth of one percent were even higher. The President referred to something along these lines in the State of the Union. This is particularly egregious, because during the same time period, the GDP in this country nearly doubled. So productivity growth amongst workers has increased by 50 percent. 
Trade isn't the only story here, but it's an important chapter. And I believe this is a very important decision we're going to make on the TPP. So increased international trade grows the pie. Uh, that's what economists tell us. But the gains go to the investors many times, the executives, the shareholders, and at the expense of the workers. Now, that's not the case all the time, but it's too often. The political fault lines around trade are really bo boiled down to that reality. So the question the administration needs to ask itself, I think, the question the members of this committee need to ask themselves is how can we make sure the benefits of trade are more broadly shared? Now, I don't think you can do it through trade promotion authority or the individual agreements alone. We need strong rules to ensure that we have a level playing field like tough environmental and labor standards. We had that with the Peruvian agreement. It was not an easy thing to come to. Thanks to members on this committee who went down to Peru and worked th things out, we had an agreement with Peru that we are proud of. Many of us, enforceable provisions on currency are absolutely essential. You've heard that over and over. But we can't simply look at these deals in a vacuum. These challenges of global globalization go far beyond just our trade policy. We need a more progressive tax code. Labor needs a bigger seat at the table. We need more investments in education and infrastructure to keep our workers in our country competitive. You've heard that today, too. We've had these things. The workers were really sharing in the benefits of, tr of trade. These deals would be far less controversial. It's clear that our current trade policies have not worked for all Americans. There may be winners, but there are plenty of losers. There's a reason they are politically controversial. I wouldn't make light of that either. I would strongly urge you to work with us as you put together trade legislation this year so that we can address the concerns many of us and our constituents have. Mr. Froman, one area where I think we can improve is the enforcement of these deals. When I went back to the, historically to each of these deals and what happened after, even you know, from NAFTA on, the enforcement mechanism it leaves a lot to be desired, if not enforcement itself. Having strong language on the environment and labor rights doesn't mean anything if we can't make sure our partners are living up to their end. And as the TPP alone represents 40% of the world's GDP, I believe you said, and the USTR will need the resources to enforce this deal. Do you think, do you think that the current enforcement resources in the different agencies, international agencies that you pointed out before, are adequate to protect American workers and businesses? Do you really believe that? Well, uh, thank you, Congressman, and I agree with much of, of what you've said, and I think it's absolutely important that we take those concerns seriously. And um, the only thing I'd say is I would distinguish between globalization and its impact, as well as technology, and the impact of trade agreements. Because in my view, trade agreements is how we shape globalization. It's how we level the playing field. The forces that you're talking about that have had an effect on wages include technology, they include globalization. We have the opportunity now to shape that, to improve that. I think on the enforcement question, I couldn't agree more. And I think uh, we would very much like to work with this committee and, and of course, the other relevant committees, appropriators and others, to make sure that the enforcement resources are there. Um, the, this president created something called the Interagency Trade Enforcement Center, based at USTR, uh, with a lot of active support by the Commerce Department and, and other departments. And uh, that has allowed us to up our game when it comes to monitoring enforcement. But there's more that we could do, both to authorize that and to make sure that whether it's at USTR or other agencies around the government, such as the Department of Labor and others, that they've got the adequate resources necessary to fully enforce these obligations. Thank you. Uh, members, time has expired. Uh, we now are going to adjourn uh, or recess. Excuse me. We're going to recess subject to the call of the chair. I might note that uh, Mr. Levin, Rangel, and myself at 4.30 have to convene the Joint Committee on Taxation for the purposes of organizing that committee. This hearing will continue on, and then we will uh, return after that uh, subcommittee is organized. So we, are, we stand uh, in recess subject to the call of the chair. Ambassador Froman. <clears throat> committee will come to order. Uh, the chairman.
The chair will advise the audience that disruption of congressional business is a violation of law and is a criminal offense. Please come to order. Now the committee stands recess subject to the call of the chair.
Thank you. <laughs> this hearing will come to order. Um, thank you for your uh, patience, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, we appreciate you returning and, and letting the rest of the members uh, ask their question. Uh, just as a reminder, this hearing will be conducted in accordance with the rules of the House and uh, appropriate decorum. And uh, the first member that's uh, recognized for, for his five minutes is Mr. Paulson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, let me just start by thanking you, Ambassador Froman, just for your responsiveness, for your leadership, and your engagement with um, my office, myself, and uh, members of both sides of the aisle just to make progress on all of these issues. You've been very open and responsive, which I think has really helped move the needle forward on some real big opportunities for the United States and our trade agreements, obviously, TTIP, TPP, et cetera. And let me ask you this. Um, you know, we've seen a very disturbing trend in recent years whereby countries, they've been ignoring international commitments and standards and this veiled attempt to support certain domestic industries uh, and constituencies. And a lot of times, of course, those decisions can be very short-sighted. Uh, they ultimately discourage innovation and investment and job growth. And you, know, you look at a country like Indonesia, for instance, that has put in place these onerous local requirement, uh, content requirements that have to be satisfied by U.S. products such as mobile devices in order to be sold in Indonesia, or you look at India, for instance, that has had challenges with our intellectual property uh, issues. And, you know, what are you doing going forward to enforce, you know, existing IP and intellectual property commitments to deter these countries from weakening these types of standards uh, in their own IP regimes, whether it's India or China? Uh, or other trading countries, and maybe you can just speak a little bit to your efforts to help secure those protections that mirror U.S. law through the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement. I know you were in India recently with the new government, and you can give us a little background maybe of the substance of your meetings and if you feel we're meeting, making progress. Thank you, Congressman. Let me perhaps take that in two parts. On the intellectual property rights piece of this, uh, within TPP, we are certainly working to get the strongest possible standards consistent with also ensuring access. And that will also, will also have strong enforcement mechanisms uh, around uh, um, administrative actions and other actions that need to be taken to ensure that not only do the rights exist, but that countries are fully committed to enforcing it. Of course, India and China are not part of, of TPP, and so we've been engaging bilaterally with them on these issues. And I'd say you know, with China, we've had some progress over the last few years as there is a rising group of Chinese entrepreneurs and innovators who now see value in having intellectual property rights and seeing them enforced. So I'm hopeful that we're going to continue to make progress there. We have a long way to go uh, in terms of the legalization of software and the protection of, of patents and other issues. But, uh, but I think we're, we, we are hopeful about making progress there. Similarly, we've engaged with the, the new government in India, and we've engaged broadly because we have some common interests. You know, we have Hollywood, they have Bollywood. We have a common interest in seeing copyright rules be strong around the world and be fully enforced. Uh, we're working, they, the, the government of India has just put out a draft intellectual property rights policy for public comment, and we're providing comments along with, uh, I'm sure, a number of other, a number of other countries and, and stakeholders. And so we're hopeful to be able to engage with them in a constructive way, uh, even in the pharmaceutical area, to look at all of the issues that relate to uh, access to affordable medicines, which go way beyond intellectual property rights. It goes to issues like the fact that they have tariffs on certain imported medicines, or that there may be distribution issues in India that we can address. We want to look at this holistically in an effort to try and move that agenda forward. Can you comment just real briefly on the, the market access barriers that are recognized by USTR Section 1377 review on the compliance with telecommunications trade agreements and the National Trade Estimate Report on foreign trade barriers in respect to Indonesia? And maybe explain a little bit of what does she plan to do to help change the trajectory of, uh, of the Indonesian protectionism that may exist in that area? Yeah, we've had some uh, good high-level engagement with uh, the new government in Indonesia as well. The president met with President Jokowi in, uh, in uh, November. I just met with my counterpart uh, last week. And we are both committed to trying to address the issues in our bilateral relationship to deepen our trade and investment relationship. One issue you mentioned in your previous question was uh, the issue of, of localization, of forced local content. And that's an issue that's popping up all around the world. And it is, in my view, the next form 
of protectionism. And so it's something I think we need to be aggressive about. And, and part of being aggressive about it is engaging with countries who have a legitimate interest in wanting to build a manufacturing sector, as we will have a very strong policy here of wanting to have a strong manufacturing sector, and engaging them about the importance of being part of a globally competitive supply chain as opposed to erecting walls around their country and supporting the development of less competitive domestic industries. So it's, uh, it's going to be an ongoing effort with, uh, with Indonesia uh, and with others, uh, but we are, we are now engaged in that dialogue. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Young, recognized for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, great to be with you today. I appreciate you staying around for sure. this uh, hearing that's extended a while. I um, want to reiterate many of my colleagues' emphasis on trade promotion authority. I've been very encouraged that uh, you and, and the administration uh, continue to indicate that uh, you're going to be seeking trade promotion authority and, and do whatever it takes to earn bipartisan support for that effort. And, and please let us know how it could be helpful in that regard. With respect to uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations, uh, I have a specific concern, and it pertains to a sector very important to my home state of Indiana. Uh, broadly, it's the life sciences field, but uh, that includes pharmaceuticals and medical devices. And as you negotiate with Japan in particular, but also many of the other countries uh, that are parties to Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, transparency and concern about fair reimbursement is a major issue, especially seeing as a number of these countries have national health systems that are very different from our own. I just want to make sure um, that all parties, businesses as well as consumers, understand that their decisions about reimbursement for, for pharmaceuticals and medical <coughs> devices are made on the merits, uh, according to optimizing health care outcomes and, and nothing else. Could you speak to this matter, please, and, and specifically indicate whether the Japanese are, are being helpful? Well, we are. Uh, we have been proposing uh, something called a transparency index uh, to promote the kind of transparency and due process that we have here in the United States under U.S. law in something called the national coverage determination um, under under Medicare, where an individual can make an appeal to have a medical device uh, covered under under insurance. It doesn't determine the level of reimbursement. It, it is about making sure that there is fairness and, and due process. And it doesn't have any effect in our country because it's already part of US law and doesn't have any effect on Veterans Affairs or Medicare or Medicaid or anything of, of, of that sort. Uh, but we do think this is a helpful step towards greater regulatory transparency. And it's something we've been promoting with the, with the other countries. Uh, we don't yet have a full agreement on that by other countries. And, I'm, and I'll have to think through what Japan's position is on it. I'm happy to get back to you on that. Uh, but it is something that we think would help promote greater transparency and ultimately help ensure that life-saving technologies uh, make their way to, to the patients who need them around, that, around the region. Thank you for that information. Um, the other concern I have relates to high-level uh, intellectual property protection. Uh, the establishment of those high-level standards, but also the enforcement, uh, which was, uh, you just spoke a bit to that. Specifically Canada, there's been some real challenges in how Canada has been dealing with our patents. Um, they've, uh, the manner in which their courts have dealt with them has been inconsistent, at least according to uh, our country's reading, inconsistent with uh, the TRIPS, intellectual property uh, agreement to which both Canada and the United States are signatories. Um, the so-called utility or usefulness standard is something that their courts are supposed to follow. Instead, they seem to be deviating from that, requiring our pharmaceutical companies and others to provide them with evidence that seems more appropriate to uh, a regulatory development. And uh, they're also not considering evidence after a patent application has been filed. Uh, perhaps you could speak to what USTR uh, and others are doing to address Canada's behavior in this area. We have uh, engaged with our Canadian counterparts uh, for some time on this. We've raised it directly with them. It is now the subject of litigation, um, and I think as a result, uh, the Canadian authorities are waiting to see what happens as a result of that litigation uh, before determining uh, what, if any, action they feel is appropriate. Okay. Uh, is there anything else that uh, we as members of Congress, I have but roughly 50 seconds left, can be doing uh, to help you get 
broader support within Congress for trade pr promotion authority so that we can ensure that the standards that are struck uh, in this agreement uh, are as high as possible, uh, that uh, they protect our workers and also open up foreign markets. Well, I think the, the kind of discussions we're having today, the executive session we had the other day, I think these are immensely helpful in terms of generating support uh, within Congress to understand what's at stake uh, for the U.S. economy, for U.S. workers and, and businesses, particularly small and medium-sized businesses, uh, what the alternatives are, what happens if we're not there protecting workers and, and American jobs, if we're not there leveling the playing field in a fair way, if we're not the ones setting the rules of the road and ceding that to, to others. And so I think uh, this committee, of course, has a privileged position in this, has always been closer to these trade agreements than any other uh, committee, and our, my hope would be to be able to work with all of you to help uh, develop a broader understanding of that uh, throughout the Congress. Well, we'll keep doing our part. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Sanchez, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Ambassador Froman, thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, I have several questions, so I'm going to just jump into them, and I apologize if I'm um, repeating what some of my colleagues may have asked. Um, I want to uh, focus on the substance of the TPP and its possible effects on copyright industry, and a lot of that industry is based in Southern California, uh, an area that I represent. Um, foreign sales from our domestic copyright industry total roughly $140 billion per year, and I just want to point out that that's twice the size of all our agricultural exports, so I just want to put it in context to show the importance of this industry within the United States economy. Um, we have seen this trend, unfortunately, in recent years where some countries are trying to ignore international commitments and standards in an attempt to support certain domestic industries and constituencies in their, in their countries. Um, and these kinds of policies uh, ultimately, I think, discourage innovation, investment, and job growth. Um, the difficulty that, we, uh, that I've had in prior trade agreements is the issue of enforcement. Uh, because you can have an agreement, but if there's no enforcement of that, or weak enforcement of that, um, you know, it's not worth the paper that it's written on. So um, if you could please describe what your agency is doing to enforce existing intellectual property commitments and um, what it is doing to try to deter other countries from weakening such standards um, in their own IP regimes, and, you know, whether that's Canada or India. Um, and in the current round of negotiations, um, how are you trying to secure IP protections f um, for the United States? Uh, well, well, thank you, Congresswoman. And we certainly agree that um, the creative industries, innovative industries in the U.S., which employ uh, 40 million Americans, uh, it's a key part of our economy. We want to make sure we're both uh, enhancing and strengthening their protection and also the access to, to, their, uh, to their products, whether it be in copyright or in, in other areas. So in TPP, for example, we are promoting strong copyright rules, strong enforcement mechanisms, whether it's on camcording or the illegal downloading of, of copyrighted material from uh, satellites or from cable. Uh, we're trying to find the, the right balance consistent with U.S. law with regard to ISP liability um, and, and uh, um, uh, the relation to that to copyright enforcement. And, of course, all of those obligations under TPB will be both uh, higher than, than, than TRIPS uh, from the WTO and fully enforceable under the TPP dispute settlement mechanism. So it will be a stronger enforcement um, process uh, than, than currently uh, than currently exists. For the parties who are not part of TPP, and you mentioned uh, India, we engage with them directly um, and using all the tools at our disposal, whether it's uh, our review of, of policies on an annual basis, our engagement at high levels to try and move their policies uh, in the right direction. And as I mentioned, I think on China we've made some progress, although we have a long ways to go. I think with India we are now engaged in a, um, a dialogue, a high-level dialogue around some of these uh, issues, and we hope to make progress uh, through that as well. Um, I just want to emphasize, don't keep your, or keep your eye on the ball there, um, because it is critically important for um, U.S. jobs. Um, I also just want to um, echo a sentiment of one of my colleagues that uh, we're pleased that the administration is 
um, uh, has committed to trying to keep Jones Act protections in place for U.S. shipbuilding industry. It's also an important component for our um, uh, national security as well. And just with my remaining time, I, I think I would be remiss if I didn't raise the issue of past trade agreements and the effect on our U.S. manufacturing sector. Um, because manufacturing, although in recent years is on the upswing, um, you know, it took a hit um, for many, many years. 60% uh, of manufacturing workers who lose jobs to trade and find reemployment typically take pay cuts. And 35% of those workers lose more than 20% of their pay, according to the Department of Labor. For the average manufacturing worker earning over $47,000, that's at least $10,000 that they lose per year. And that race to the bottom, I think, has um, contributed to uh, um, the suppression of U.S. worker wages um, at the same time that worker productivity has gone up dramatically. So given that the past is a very strong guide here for where we want to be in the future, because we obviously don't want to repeat those mistakes, how can you guarantee that the TPP is going to help working families in this country? Well, we certainly uh, are firmly in agreement that what we need to be doing through these trade agreements is helping to drive more manufacturing and more production and higher wages uh, in the U.S. It is interesting that if you take our FTA countries as a whole, we have a trade surplus, including a trade surplus in manufacturing and that that trade surplus has been growing over time. So I think we have to distinguish between globalization and technology on one hand and the impact of trade agreements on the other. Uh, globalization and technology, as you mentioned, have had an effect on, on wages and on manufacturing, although we're glad to see almost 800,000 new manufacturing jobs created over the last uh, four years in this country. And uh, trade agreements can help further that by making the U.S. an even more attractive place to build manufacturing plants so that we can produce things here and send them all over the world. And that's exactly what we're trying to do through TPP. And ladies, time has expired. Mr. Meehan, you're recognized. Uh, let me thank the chairman and let me thank you, Ambassador, for your, uh, for your uh, being here and giving us the opportunity to, to, to speak with you so extensively. And I want to follow up on the gentlelady's questioning uh, from California. I have been interested in this issue of the free flow of information in a variety of different contexts. Having previously served as a cyber chair in another committee, I am watching the development of the opportunities, but also the tremendous challenges globally. So one of the first things that sort of is by analogy, and I think you've touched it, but I'm interested in how this kind of a process will work, was the, the, the flow of, uh, you know, information that, that in the past we had trading agreements, and in order for people to get their products into foreign markets. You used to have to have a manufacturing facility or otherwise built there in order for them to open it up. Uh, now, of course, without borders, we can move information a lot easier. But we're beginning to see the beginning of people saying that, you know, you have to have some kind of a server located in a particular country or some kind of data processing being done locally. Are we taking steps to assure that whatever determinations are made are being done fairly? so that we don't have those kinds of impediments yes, I mean, put into it? And how are you doing that? Well, certainly. And as a, I mean, a key part of TPP is to address this kind of issue, and in, and in most areas, to um, insist that it not be necessary to build redundant infrastructure in a country in order to serve that market and to maintain the free flow of data and information cross-border in order to be able to provide those cross-border Services. So, in most areas, that's an area that, that's a I don't call, that's an area that we're trying to to, to lock in in, in TPP. You know, there are legitimate privacy issues and, and other legitimate regulatory issues that we need to accommodate. But as a general matter, that's where we're trying to land. How are we dealing with those questions of privacy and other things? Because it is opening the door to some very unique situations in which some people are saying, "Okay, the ability in 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 in, in how we move information here." There may be higher standards being created someplace in Europe. One of the concepts, and I was in Italy, it, uh, the concept of an individual's right to their own private identity and therefore requirements that you must get approvals for uses of names. It's not the same. Maybe it's the right place to go, but it's not the way we are doing it here. So how, how do you protect against more restrictive covenants that are being, they're saying, well, fine, we don't care if you are 
service provider is here, but any service provider that's doing business must accord by these laws. How do we in this globally developing area make sure that American interests are represented so that we can fairly see resolutions of these sort of undefined rules of the road? Well, this is going to be an area that we're going to have to have some uh, serious discussions with, with our, particularly in Europe, where privacy concerns are, are very high. And we want to make sure what we're doing is recognizing legitimate privacy concerns, <clears throat> uh, while at the same time, uh, them not being used as just an excuse to create national internets or national clouds uh, and to allow the internet and technology to develop in such a way as, for example, to have small businesses be able to access markets all over the world. So we'll be working with our counterparts on that uh, to, on one hand, ensure that legitimate privacy concerns are respected, and on the other hand, to ensure that we are allowing technology to evolve in such a way um, as, to, as to take advantage of the interconnectedness. You've got a lot on your plate, and I know the many issues that you have to deal with and negotiate. These are complex things. Do you have the resources and the focus to be able to do this, not just on a unilateral basis, I shouldn't say, not on a one-on-one -on -one basis if a particular country is taking an approach differently, but you know, multiple countries, you, you've, you've got multiple chapters of the agreement and multiple countries that are affected. Is everybody going to speak with one voice in the resolution? And really, final question, how do you enforce something if we've got a disagreement with somebody? And we say, you've mentioned that there are some capacities to take this to a higher, you know, a higher resolution. How does that enforcement concept work and what kind of teeth are there in there for us? Well, uh, let me answer the last question first, which is, you know, one of the strengths of TPP is that uh, there is a strong dispute settlement and enforcement mechanism across the whole agreement, across all of the across uh, virtually all of the obligations, uh, uh, whether it's labor and environment or intellectual property or these uh, commercial commitments around cross-border data flows and, and other issues. And so that allows the countries to come together if there's a concern to consult, to establish an arbitration panel um, if necessary, for that arbitration panel to make a judgment about whether there is a violation, and ultimately, if it's not remedied, for there to be the application of trade sanctions, and that, on, and try and do so on a, a time-defined basis, so that there can be real, real recourse. I think on your previous question, that we have a terrific team at USTR. We're a small agency, about 250 uh, employees, but they are incredibly dedicated. They work incredibly hard. They're incredibly professional, and. Uh, uh, we may be lean, but, uh, uh, but, but we have the capacity, I think, to address all of these American interests. Right. Well, thank you. We've been working along with you on this. Thank you. Ms. Noem, uh, recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Ambassador, South Dakota's number one industry is agriculture, so that's obviously a big priority for us. It supports over 20,000 jobs in the state. And when our ag sector hears about um, Japan's resistance on TPP negotiations to open it up, and to have good discussion on products like pork and beef and dairy, that's alarming for many of them. And uh, we tend to start losing support then for TPP, which I don't blame them because it is big issues back home. But while Japan argues um, that they're not taking any products off the table, they certainly are refusing to fully liberalize a lot of their individual tariff lines when it comes to those product categories. So that is a concern for me and not necessarily a question, just something I know we've discussed here today. But following up on that, Japan isn't the only country that's causing some concern. We're also uh, looking at Canada and uh, the fact that they're refusing to make any open offer on dairy, poultry, and egg markets. And so as a close neighbor to my home state, that is also very uh, concerning for people back home. And another thing that we'll be watching very closely as the negotiations continue. But I did want to discuss w with you the EU agreement a little bit. I know some of their ag tariffs are high and have to be reduced, uh, but a lot of my producers back home are even more concerned about the non-science based regulations that are blocking uh, our country's market access. And so we need to rely on sound science when it comes to our trade standards. Would you expand on some of the key barriers that we do face when it comes to that agreement and what our export or exporters are dealing with and how do you plan to address some of those barriers that are currently out there? Sure. First, let me just say with regard to uh, the Japan agriculture market access questions that you raised, mm -hmm. we're working very closely with our commodity groups, uh, beef, pork, dairy, uh, et cetera, uh, as we negotiate with Japan to ensure not just that all products are covered, 
but that there is commercially meaningful market access in our priority areas, and we'll stay closely in touch with, with you that. and them on that. With the European Union, uh, we, I, we completely agree that it's not just an issue of tariffs, it's an issue of, of standards and making sure that those standards are, are science-based and that they're not using other restrictions, um, such as GIs, to keep our, our products out. And so that's the array of issues that we'll be engaging with them on. Um, we know that they have certain sensitivities in that area, but we are committed to opening their market. Our ag exports have grown uh, very significantly over the last several years to a, uh, now a hundred, over $150 billion, but our ag exports to the EU have been relatively flat mm -hmm. during this whole period, and we want to make sure that our Made in America products can make it into those, into those markets. Great. Just a last comment that I would make is that we've been watching the dispute that's been going on at the ports as well. And we have a lot of products that need to be moved in a timely manner. So I know a resolution is being worked on, but I also wanted to emphasize how important it is to the products that are coming out of our state as well. So thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Larson is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you so much for your opening uh, remarks. And uh, our chairman is always good at analogies. And I don't want <clears throat> to deflate anything he had to say at the outset and noting that everybody on this committee is a patriot. And uh, certainly, Ambassador, you are. And uh, I want to thank you for the enormous amount of time and work and effort and persistency, echoing the remarks of a number of people, most notably uh, Mr. Kind, who have spoke. I would also, Mr. Chairman, for the record, like to uh, uh, submit uh, uh, letters from uh, Letter signed by Walter Jones, Duncan Hunter, um, and uh, Mr. Lobiondo, and a letter submitted by Mrs. Deloro DeFazio and Mr. Doyle for uh, the record. Without objection. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. In so many respects, this is um, uh, like the Super Bowl of trade, and I think the one thing uh, that everybody wants to uh, recognize and has been repeated on this committee is that we uh, want to make sure that there's full and open transparency. Uh, people want to be participants. In other words, we don't want to find ourselves in the situation of the Packers being on the sidelines this weekend and watching the Patriots uh, participate, all of us being uh, patriots. Some of us may be more Seahawkish about trade than others, but nonetheless, uh, this is the uh, this is where we come. And uh, Ambassador, you did a couple of things, and, uh, and and I think that cuts to the chase with respect to transparency and the concern that's uh, developed, and oftentimes for people just trying to sort through uh, TPP. Uh, versus fast track and uh, you know so it's those things can become complicated to the uh, average American citizen let alone uh, members of, of, of Congress and I believe it was Mr. Kind who pointed out what are the consequences of not taking action and so my questions would be a would you commit to continued transparency and as is outlined in these letters by a number of members who as you heard here from a number of our colleagues who are skeptical about the transparent effort and the ability for America to come out of this on uh, advantaged, and then who the losers will be, but especially, as you outlined previously, what are the consequences of no agreement? Well, we are uh, certainly committed to uh, continuing and improving on transparency, and in the broadest sense of it, in terms of for example, I, again, I, I hearken back to the, the the meetings that Mr. Levin organized with the Ways and Means Democrats and other Democrats from the caucus, including uh, some of the people you mentioned, about various issues in the negotiation and having deep dives on those issues so that we can answer questions and concerns. Because but we truly, uh, we share Mr. Those Doggett's uh, questions that were that he posed in terms of being able to go into the room, being able to take people who have got clearance from the staff. I mean, these were bipartisanly expressed today, I think those will go a long way towards end, ending the skepticism and doubt that exists and everybody pulling together for a <clears throat> patriotic outcome. Well, we'll look forward to, uh, I think, uh, working with the chairman, the ranking member, and this committee, and also on the finance side to take up those ideas and determine how best to, uh, to move forward. 
Thank you. Thank you. The uh, gentleman has a minute left, so I'll just indulge. Um, the Packers are an export-related <laughs> team. Uh, it refers to meat packers um, putting uh, beef products on ships in Lake Michigan out to the St. Lawrence Seaway and on to exporting. Um, two of the team owners are right up here on the dais. And um, we thank you, the gentleman, for acknowledging and uh, I always very good want to export. acknowledge the chairman, export and I know, related. I believe it was Walter Mondale who said, where's the beef and where's the cheese on top of it? You know, we want to make sure. Always cheese comes always with beef in Wisconsin. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, Mr. Holding. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, just so you hear from um, all the way from the West Coast to the East Coast about the West Coast port situation. The, um, even us in North Carolina are impacted by this. Um, our port products to Asia are being um, delayed, and we've even developed um, specialty port products for Asia uh, for that market, and um, so it's impacting us. So I know um, you've already said the administration will work diligently to resolve this, and I encourage you to do so. Um, to harken back to um, the question that you had about biologics, the, um, we all know the United States world leader in biologics, you know, great advances in medicine, and um, you know, the, the business model that has worked uh, to propel and make uh, this research um, cost viable is to have 12 years of data protection. And, um, you know, that's the law of the land here, and I appreciate that you know, that is the position that you are advocating in the trade negotiations, correct? Um, the president has suggested seven years. So with the president's suggestion of seven years out there, do you think that undermines your bargaining position um, in the trade negotiations? I think our trading partners have a wide range of views on this as reflected by the fact that five of them have zero years, four of them have five years, two of them have eight years, and we're the one that has 12 years. And so um, I think uh, uh, the key is having this dialogue with them about the importance of both promoting innovation, making this region a center for innovation, creating an innovation ecosystem, uh, while at the same time addressing the issues of access to affordable medicines. Uh, particularly in developing countries. And so those are the those are the ways we're going about this, and we're having uh, a dialogue with these countries, but this is clearly one of the most difficult, outstanding issues. So the president's suggestion of seven years does or does not undermine your bargaining position? I think they understand that our, our the law of the land is, is 12 years. We've made the case of why there needs to be an extended period of data protection and how to ensure that there is affordable access to, to medicines as well. So it does or does not undermine your bargaining position? I don't think it undermines our bargaining position. Okay. The, uh, if you were to accept something as low as five years, uh, what do you think would be the impact of accepting uh, five years of data protection on our biologics uh, industry here in the United States? Uh, that's uh, something we'd, I'd have to look to the, uh, to the industry for, uh, for feedback on, but uh, um, we have been uh, certainly advocating how extended periods of data protection can help promote innovation, not just in our country, but around the world, and it makes sure that drugs are introduced to markets uh, earlier. And so uh, that's the argument that we're taking to our trading partners. But one would suspect uh, uh, five years of data protection would not be beneficial to our biologics uh, industry here in the United States. I think what drives the development, as I understand it, of our biologics in the U.S. is the, the period of protection that we provide here in this country. Thank you. The, and just to switch gears, um, India was mentioned earlier, and you know, I understand it's not part of the pending trade agreements, but with the President's recent trip to India, I guess he arrived back today. The, um, anything that you would like to relay um, uh, regarding trade and the promotion of um, trade relations, business relations with India? You know, I note that it has grown from $14 billion in 2000 to $93 billion in 2012, and they're our 11th largest trading partner now. Um, so anything from the visit transpire that uh, portends some better trade relations and promotion of business between the two countries? Well, as the President noted while he was there, we think there is great potential to further develop, go from that $100 billion that currently exists to something, to something much higher. And there's a lot of uh, excitement and interest in the kind of policies that the new government has expressed in, in India has expressed 
uh, interest in. And I think the key now is to, through our dialogue with them, to explore how those policies are going to be put in place and, and whether they're going to address the business environment in such a way as to increase trade investment. I had a good, uh, there was a trade policy forum meeting in November of last year, the first one we've had in four years, where we laid out an important series of work plans on intellectual property, on manufacturing, on services, and I'm following up with the government, uh, including during my recent visit there with the president, to determine how best to take those, those issues forward. Good. I have a few questions regarding IPR and TTIP in the EU, which I'll submit for the record, but thank you for your time. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Ringel is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ambassador, for your patience with this committee. You certainly have spent a lot of hours with us, and you've been very patient with us, and I want really to be able to help to find out whether or not at the end of the day we can end up with on the same page. I, I think you will agree that the greatest opposition to this trade bill and any trade bill in our great country is the general feeling that jobs will be lost. If you don't think that's the major problem, then I, I, I like to remove myself from this line of questioning because everywhere I go, there are committees organizing. They say they don't know what's in the bill, but they're against it. They don't want to give the president the authority to negotiate a bill. And uh, I don't think we've done an effective job in explaining how we made out with NAFTA or Korea. So if you disagree with me, just for the sake of uh, those people who really believe that trade is going to be a job loser, there's no question in my mind that your position is that this is an economic growth job builder and the, the, the future of America is going to be dependent on our ability to effectively compete and make America stronger. And that necessarily means that jobs will be created even though it's difficult to determine which industries will be the winners and losers. But you're convinced and you represent our country that America has got to come out ahead. If that is so, then I would like to say we should be prepared to assume the responsibility to meet this great economic opportunity with these jobs. It would be disgraceful if you've done your job and hundreds of millions of jobs would be available and then we find out that we forgot to ask somebody what skills will be necessary for our workforce. Also, how would we transport this new opportunity in this great nation with its bridges and its roads crumbling? Will we be prepared for this great economic uh, opportunity? And since in every agreement there's winners and losers, do we have this structure there to support those great Americans who through no fault of their own would lose their jobs as they open up the doors for progress for the rest of the country and the world. That's my way of asking you, where the hell are the jobs? And until I can go into town hall meetings or speak to reporters and they ask what's in it for me, I can't say cheese, uh, I can't talk about uh, uh, what's going to happen with the pharmaceutical corporations. My community and communities like that throughout this country have to find something to blame their loss of income and jobs on. And it looks like trade is the best thing to kick because they can't fight back. Those who've lost their jobs complain. Those that have gained opportunities believe that they got it on their, on their own. So I need someone from your shop that deals with preparing America for these great opportunities that's going to exist. And I don't want to take your time because I now understand why they give the title to our trade negotiators as being a diplomat, because you are, you are that. But if there's someone without your diplomatic skills, 
that can share with me where the hell the jobs are gonna come from and which ones we're gonna lose. I like to get out there with the flag and the plan and say that, of course, some people gotta feel pain, but most people are gonna prosper. We got a middle class out there that we're losing. You talk about small businesses, if they're not working, they can't buy. So who is it besides you that's got this work plan all there so that I can work on that part of it? Who, who would you recommend, well, His uh, Excellency? <laughs> Congressman, we will find some undiplomatic people on my staff to, to work with yours. Uh, I think uh, Secretary Perez and I would be happy to, uh, to, to work with you on that because uh, I know it's an issue that you've raised before about making sure that our people are prepared to take the jobs that are going to be created by this. Let me just say, while I don't have details down to the level of the district, for a state like New York, which has 300 and more than 300,000 people whose jobs are tied just to the export of goods, not including services, 41,000 companies export from the state of New York, 94% of whom are small and medium-sized businesses. And when we look at the opportunities for New York State to take chemicals, New York exports about $5 billion in chemicals, but there's 35% tariffs in some of the TPP countries that will go to zero. New York exports $27 billion of consumer goods. There are 85% tariffs <coughs> in some of the TPP countries that will go to zero. Machinery, I could go it, sector by sector, and while it's hard to say exactly how many jobs each of those moves on the tariff lines are gonna create, um, we know that New York is one of the great beneficiaries of international trade and will continue to be so because we've got competitive workers in New York, we've got competitive industries, whether it's in manufacturing services or agriculture, and in each of these areas we're opening markets. <clears throat> Let me just say one final thing, Mr. Chairman, if I can. There are, we obviously do have sensitive sectors in our country. We, uh, Mr. Levin talked about, about autos. Uh, we could talk about textiles. Uh, we could talk about uh, footwear. These are areas where we have higher tariffs than in some other areas. And what we've done is work very closely with the textile industry, with the footwear industry, and obviously with the auto industry to make sure that whatever we do in this area is taking into account the sensitivities that they face. So we're trying to deal with the issue of, of, of how to deal with our sensitivities. Ultimately, one of the things we've made clear is that we think TAA, Trade Adjustment Assistance, ought to be reauthorized um, as part of this process, because it is important that we give our people and our workers the skills that they need to compete in this global economy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ambassador, in October of last year, the government of Turkey self-initiated an anti-dumping case against uh, the U.S. cotton exports. Uh, Turkey has been the number two exporter for U.S. cotton, um, export market for U.S. cotton for the last recent years. Um, some of my colleagues and myself have has written you and the Commerce Secretary of our concerns about this case. Um, what is the, the U.S. government um, doing up until this point right now in this investigation? Uh, we have uh, engaged with the government of Turkey to express our concern about this. Of course, every government, every country does have the right to bring trade remedy actions, provided they do so consistent with the WTO and our industries avail themselves of our anti-dumping and countervailing duty uh, laws as well. Uh, what our role is at USTR is if a country is bringing an action under their trade remedy uh, laws in a way that violates their WTO commitments, as China has done in a series of cases, uh, we're able to bring a case to the WTO and have those cases undone. And so we're monitoring this case closely to see how it's proceeding. We're making clear to uh, the government of Turkey our concerns about it, um, and we stand ready to take action um, if we believe that at the end of the day they've applied their trade remedy laws in an inappropriate fashion. Thank you. Um, I have great concern just about statements that I've read from media clips that um, members of the government in Turkey have said the reasons why they brought actions. So that's why I bring this case up. Um, on a total, on the other side of this coin, um, I'm also deeply concerned that the United States companies legitimately who use the anti-dumping and, and countervailing duty orders to protect themselves from trade violations, these orders are not always effectively enforced. Um, I have a couple of questions. First, what improvements could be made to our trade agreements to improve enforcement at, of the anti-dumping and counterva countervailing duty orders at the border? One thing we've been doing in TPP is to um, have a, a, a series of, a chapter in a series of obligations around 
Customs Cooperation and Enforcement. And we work very closely with uh, the Department of Homeland Security and Customs and Border Protection on their role of enforcing uh, trade laws and trade measures as well. So TPP will give us a further opportunity to strengthen that kind of cooperation with other customs organizations so there isn't uh, circumvention by countries of anti-dumping and countervailing duty orders. Okay. Um, also, Ambassador, in 2012, the, wor the World Organization for Animal Health awarded U.S. beef with the highest safety designation possible. Despite this high safety rating, countries like Japan, China, Korea, Taiwan, and Vietnam continue to have age-based restrictions on U.S. beef products. With U.S. beef having the highest safety designation possible, these restrictions are beginning to look like non-tariff trade barriers. Um, what is USTR doing to open the remaining markets that currently have age-based restrictions on U.S. beef? We are working uh, very closely with uh, the Department of Agriculture as well as with our stakeholders in the, in the beef sector uh, to further open markets consistent with that OIE finding. And we are uh, pleased that we've been able to open up uh, Japan, uh, Korea, uh, Hong Kong, uh, Mexico, a number of other of countries to um, uh, some of our beef exports, and we're continuing to press ahead with that. One of our areas of concern remains China, which had uh, promised to take the steps forward on opening their beef market uh, last year and have yet to do so. And, we're gonna, and we were just in, uh, as I mentioned, in Chicago with the JCCT, including with Secretary Vilsack and Secretary Pritzker uh, in, in our efforts to press them to move forward with opening their beef market. Um, Ambassador, I represent probably one of the most diversified agriculture districts outside of the state of California. We grow everything in our district, but citrus and sugar. Um, we grow a lot of rice. And so it is my understanding that before the 1962 embargo with Cuba, um, Cuba was the number one importer of U.S. rice. Um, uh, Cuba is currently the second largest importer of rice in the Americas. Um, what do you think the benefits of normalizing relations with Cuba will would have in the U.S. agriculture community and crops like rice? Well, I know that our uh, agricultural community is um, excited by the potential opportunities that normalization uh, provides. I don't have uh, a lot of direct information about the rice market per se, but we're happy to get back to you on that. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ambassador, not only for your skilled diplomacy, but also for your patience. We appreciate your efforts to craft new trade agreements, such as the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, in such a way that benefit U.S. jobs. Of course, I come from a job-producing area, I represent a part of Chicago and the western suburbs of that city, which over the years we have proudly claimed as the candy and confectionery capital of the United States. To maintain our competitiveness with world markets, we need to ensure that we have an adequate supply of sugar at reasonable prices. Unfortunately, we have a sugar program that unduly limits the availability of sugar, which causes Chicago-based companies to pay as much as 50 percent more for sugar than their overseas competitors who have access to world markets. To help improve our prospects for keeping confectionery and bacon jobs in Chicago and other places, the TPP could provide new market access for TPP countries that have sugar for export, whether it is raw sugar from Australia or refined sugar from Canada. With the TPP negotiations nearing conclusions, my question is, do we have commitment to provide commercially meaningful access to TPP countries that have sugar available for shipment to the United States? Well, uh, Congressman, you know, this is an area of, of that has traditionally been very sensitive in our trade negotiations, and uh, we've committed that whatever additional access there might be to the U.S. market, to the U.S. sugar market, uh, won't undermine uh, the U.S. sugar program. 
uh, but we are working with our stakeholders and uh, with our trading partners to try and find a solution here that, that addresses, uh, uh, that, that finds the right, pardon my pun, sweet spot in that regard. I certainly appreciate that position, but I'm also concerned about the Department of Commerce agreements that were signed back in December of last year, which place new limits on sugar import, imports from Mexico and significantly raise prices for American consumers and food manufacturers. Although I know that you as the U.S. Trade Representative were not a part to this new managed trade deal with Mexico, can we expect that any future trade agreements, whether with Mexico or other sugar exporting countries, will allow them to have fair access to the U.S. market so that we have as competitively priced sugar that our manufacturers can have access to so that people in the food and sugar industry can in fact continue to work and produce jobs? Well, as I said, we are working to uh, strike the right balance between um, allowing further trade and protecting the, the U.S. sugar program, which uh, is uh, the, the law of the land. And so we're continuing to work on this issue. It's one of the outstanding issues um, in our agricultural negotiations with our uh, trading partners, and we will continue to work on that. Thank you very much. And they're always concerned about enforcement of labor and environmental standards uh, in any of these negotiations. Could you just comment on how those uh, negotiations seem to be going? Absolutely. While we're not uh, done yet, uh, we've made uh, very good progress in those negotiations. I think we're heading in the right direction. And that's both in terms of setting strong obligations in the labor and environmental area and making sure consistent with the May 10th agreement, that they are fully enforceable. They're in the core of the agreement, and they're fully enforceable with the same type of dispute settlement process, the same time frame as any other provision in the trade agreement, including ultimately the availability of trade sanctions if the, the problem is not remedied. And so this, I think, will take that issue um, uh, uh, much further in terms of applying to 40% of the global economy and um, solidifying the notion that labor and environmental issues, again, consistent with the May 10 agreement, uh, should be treated as seriously as other commitments in the trade agreement. Thank you very much, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Ambassador, thank you for enduring. Uh, you know, we've talked about a lot of different things today. Mr. Tiberi talked about the electrical steel in Zanesville. I also have the same company that, represent, that I represent in Butler, Pennsylvania. It was Armco Steel. It's now AK Steel. I believe we build or make the finest electrical steel in the world. We're concerned about that. Then we also talked about the free flow of information, data flow, and, and how countries could could game us and keep us out of that, out of being able to compete or or overreach in their, their ability and eliminate the, the, the uh, competitive edge. So I sent a letter to you, along with uh, Mr. Kine, back in October. And I would like, Mr. Chairman, to submit it in, into the testimony today if there's no objection. Uh, that, that address this situation. But I really want to get down to what we're talking about here. Maybe you can help because everybody's talked about things that concern them and their district. The reality of this is, what leverage do we have? I mean, we go into these, uh, these negotiations in good faith. I really uh, I agree with that. We'd, I think we have this uh, kind of a naive belief that somehow people are going to negotiate with us in good faith and that somehow, because we have these trade agreements, they're not going to take advantage. Now, Mr. Uh, Meehan talked a little bit. So what are the teeth? I mean, how do you enforce this? So you find somebody who's not acting in the right way. What do you do? What's the enforcement? How Are there any teeth there that really could force them back into a situation that they agreed to? Well, yes. And, and the way these trade agreements work and the way the TPP works is that there'll be a strong dispute settlement mechanism across, virtually across the board of the agreement so that if you believe a country's violating its obligations, you can trigger consultations. You can trigger the formation of an arbitration panel who that then makes the determination in a limited period of time of whether that country is in violation or not. Then it assesses damages, and the country either comes into compliance or you can impose trade sanctions commensurate with those damages uh, against the other country. And that's it's the existence of that dispute settlement mechanism and the various stages along the way that hold other countries' feet to the fire. If you can, though, give me a little bit of an idea. Time is always of the essence with these. So people run out the clock on us, and an opportunity gets lost. Uh, if we are truly going to have an economic recovery, and if we believe that 95% of the market is outside our country, 
uh, I look at this, so I keep wondering, you know, so if we really, because my whole life I've been in the negotiating business, uh, but I had to have a product that somebody wanted to own and I wanted to sell. But we're right now engaged in a situation where geopolitically, the relationships that we build are really would be the determining factor of how we get countries to behave the right way, whether it's through sanctions, which we've used to a certain effect. But how do you build that? And again, I keep going back to this. I know we have these things in place, but really, how do you enforce them? How do you get people to do that? Because the time element, they can run, you, they can run out the clock on this. By the time you get done going through all those, uh, those, uh, those mechanisms, you've lost the sale. Well, one thing we've, we have uh, worked to do in TPP is to ensure that the dispute settlement process is time bound, that it's, uh, it's, it's faster than you know, other dispute settlement procedures at the WTO or otherwise. And in some cases, for example, with the Japan auto is part of our agreement, that there's a specific accelerated dispute settlement mechanism with, uh, with real teeth to enforce uh, the obligations that we secure there. And so we're fully committed to doing that. And it's that the existence of that dispute settlement that tends to get countries to to abide by their to abide by their commitments. Uh, but it's it, to, to to broaden out. It's our engagement through this process. These countries want to be in partnership with us. They want to be economic partners. They want to be strategic partners with us. And TPP gives us that opportunity to work with them across a wide range. I, of I listen. I believe philosophically that what you're saying is correct. The reality of this, of this whole situation is if we can't use some kind of leverage, all the good faith in the world and all the great talk in the world and all the open heartedness in the world is fine if, it, if, if we just talk about it. I've just watched what's going on in the world today in a world that's becoming more and more unstable. If we're really going to be the, the defenders of freedom and liberty around the world, we better be the strongest economic machine that's out there or people aren't going to pay attention to us. My great fear is that while we sit and wonder about what we can do to help you get there, the rest of the world is, they're, they're going to progress. They're going to move on. We're going to miss our chance. And I really, I, I'm greatly concerned about that. I've watched us lose too much market share because of what we go through. The debate becomes too heavy. The results get dragged out too long. We lose an opportunity to gain market share and then sit back and wonder what is it we're doing wrong. And some of the things we're talking about, if we can't get the American people to understand that these agreements provide features and benefits that add value to our people, to our economy, we can't possibly get the sale made. And that's where I'm concerned right now. We've talked about all these things that affect us, whether it be cheese or cars or steel or, 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 or any intellectual properties. Bottom line, we've got to have something people want to buy, and we've got to be able to be in a position that they're the ones, we're the ones they want to buy it from. We can't enforce, we can't, we can't get people to think the way we think if we're not attached economically. Geopolitically, it just doesn't work any other way. There's no other reason to want to be with us. And that's the thing that I worry about because what's going on with TPP, <clears throat> what's going on in Europe, we're going to lose those markets and sit back and wonder why we Thank lost them. It's because of our inability agree. to react quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, last but certainly not least, Mrs. Black from Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, all of the members that have stayed around, and especially you, Ambassador. Thank you for being here today and being so patient to answer everyone's questions. Um, I really appreciate that. I also want to thank you for your response to my letter that regarding the inclusion of the children's electronic uh, education devices on the list of the un uh, negotiation for the expansion of the information technology agreement. And um, for those who really, who, who don't realize this, there are books and toys that are duty free, but because these computer devices don't fit in one of those categories, even though they're educational, they are not duty free. So I plan to reintroduce my eTeach uh, Act in the coming weeks, and I look forward to our continuing dialogue. I know that many of my uh, colleagues have talked about how this would benefit us here in this country. And so the significant benefits here are not only to the manufacturers, but also to the consumers, especially our young children. Um, by one estimate, updating the ITA would boost global GDP by $190 billion and would increase our U.S. exports uh, by $3 billion, creating over 60,000 American jobs. So for many purposes, this really is um, I hope the thing that can get done. I know we have bipartisan support um, from members of our trade committee here. I think about two thirds of them have signed on and uh, I look forward to um, the continuing conversation and hope that you will be able to uh, make this happen. And I wondered if you might give me some encouragement um, of where this might be at this point in time. 
Well, we had this breakthrough with China back in November, which allowed the ITA negotiations to get restarted in, uh, in Geneva. Uh, we have further work to do to try and bridge differences between countries. We're encouraging the countries, uh, particularly uh, Korea and China, to, to, uh, to resolve their differences, We're encouraging China to be more flexible uh, in accommodating what needs to be done in order to resolve uh, these issues. Um, and we're hopeful that we'll continue to make progress toward an agreement, as you say, that can have such a significant impact on U.S. jobs, on U.S. exports, as well as on the global economy. So is my understanding that China really is the, the barrier that's there right now? At, at this stage, there are, there are differences of views between Korea and China, and we are trying to find ways to bridge those differences and encouraging China to be flexible in its approach in order to resolve the outstanding issues. Thank you, and I appreciate everyone staying around for my question, and I will yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Ambassador, it, you started here, what, at 2 o'clock, I think? And then you did the Senate Finance Committee this morning, right? So Indeed. you definitely earned your pay today. Um, thank you very much for indulging our committee members. I think this is an excellent hearing. I think a lot of members got the points they wanted to get across, the questions they wanted to ask. I appreciate uh, your indulgence on this, and we will uh, see you very soon because we have a lot to work, a lot of work to do. So I appreciate your time. I appreciate uh, your expertise, and uh, this committee stands adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.